Hey, everybody. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar and Music Licensing Profits. I've got an amazing guest, a super talented lady who has accomplished so much. And uh, I got a feeling she's kind of just getting started with Renee Meredith. Give you the Cliff Notes version on Renee. She is the co-founder and COO of a company called Exploration. They are a copyright administration and digital rights management companies, company for songwriters, music publishers, artists and small labels and they're out of la and we'll explain exactly what renee does and how she helps artists and musicians she graduated from belmont university in nashville with a degree in music business and you can find her company online at exploration.io and i got to tell you she has one of the most thorough pages like if you want to learn in detail how this business works and what can be done i'm not throwing smoke blown smoke your page the uh, exploration to io forward slash learn there's like great videos there they're short i mean it's everything that you want to know on there so if you're interested check out that page anyway thanks for your time i appreciate you coming on the show thank you that's great it's great and uh, I'm glad to I'll, be here oh yeah and i want to thank john defari my partner in music licensing profits for hooking us up john is all right john is amazing let's get into this your first involvement with music renee you were a mm -hmm. roadie for your yes. grandfather's gospel music band mm -hmm. traveling through country churches throughout southern missouri and a few curious. little hole in the wall honky tonks i guess you could call them oh maybe. honky tonks yeah that's kind of not really a honky tonk. it gospel. wasn't much dancing but maybe you know it was uh it was a gospel band at the church revivals and it was a blues band uh, <laughs> at the at the places between the revivals that's I awesome yeah, yeah, I had a guy on the show, musician, one time. He goes, uh, "Hey, Daddy's got to pay the rent," something like that. That's and it's, true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how old were you when you started doing this, and what was the most important thing you took away from that experience? Um, I was six when I started. Oh, wow! Uh, okay. I was six years old, um, and uh, my grandfather was just amazing and and wonderful, and he he recognized that I, it, there was something else. There was something more. I, I had declared in front of God and everybody that I wanted to be Joe Perry when I grew up. And, you know, I was six. I didn't know what that meant. Um, you know, and so I, uh, but I just, I loved, um, it, there was just something about the way Joe Perry played and, and seeing him perform was the first time I'd ever seen electric guitar live. And I just, I was like, I was in love with guitars. I wanted to know everything I could know. Um, and my grandfather saw something within me that was about wanting to learn and wanting to know and, and wanting to grow into, into music and everything. So, um, he, he just nurtured that as best he could and, and helped me to, you know, learn. And the thing that I took away, there's so many lessons, so many life lessons to take away from that whole experience. Um, that was from the time I was six until he died when I was 18. And, um, it, it, just so many things. Um, but I think the first thing I learned and the thing that has served me best is that guitars are heavy. <laughs> <laughs> that was the very first thing I learned. It was like, <laughs> you know, it doesn't look like they're heavy, but you've got to, you know, don't let, um, don't let the guitar case drag the ground. And so he let me struggle and figure out how to carry this thing when you know it's as big as me or bigger yeah. and and he let me struggle and carry it with only the caveat of don't let it drag on the ground and that lesson really taught me that like just you can do it and you can do it any way you want don't let it drag on the ground and so that um that really helped me to understand how capable i was and how yeah to figure things out. I mean, I didn't know that's the lesson I was learning in the moment. Right. But there wasn't anything that I couldn't tear down or put together or load in or load out. There wasn't anything that I couldn't 
work on in that respect, as long as it didn't drag the grip. And that, that's something that has stuck with me through the years. That yeah, you could yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. That I could do yeah. it. And yeah. maybe I don't do it like, like the other guys do it. You know, maybe I don't pick it up and carry it, you know, like this at my side because I was too small, but maybe I pick it up and put it over my head or maybe I, you know, maybe I figure out something. Um, it was a glorious day when I was like around 10 and I figured out what carts were, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, um, that I could throw it on top of a case and let it hitch a ride and it wouldn't dead the ground. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, I think that was the first really big lesson. That I think that's so that important. Stayed. And like people, pa parents don't really, yeah. I, I, worked on stuff like that with my kids but it's a i was in the minority it was like f walking up you know up a mountain everybody's like oh let me make it easy for you i'm like well what are you going to do when they go out and get a job <laughs> you know right if you can't if they're mm -hmm. not confident enough to carry that case they're they're going to be miserable yeah. on their job yeah this is true this is true and it's the same is true for teaching kids about music like if they're if you're carrying, if they decide they want to play the cello, but dad's always carrying the cello for them, how yes. are they ever going to learn that like, this is a part, this, if you want this to be a part of your life, carrying it is going to be a part of your life. Carrying yeah. the amp is going to be a part of your life. All of those things. And also the problem solving. Or, yes. you know, a lot of times it's not just that they make it easier, but sometimes... I see, and it's not just parents, it's grandparents or even myself. I'm guilty as an auntie of trying to say, do it this way or do it the way we've always done it. Yeah. I even sometimes do that as a boss. And you can limit somebody's creativity and their potential if you were just hard line, like, do it this specific way or sure. do everything the way I tell you to or, you know. Um, and I think that, that, you know, when you're ever, you're a teacher or you're a person in authority, be it a parent or a boss or, or a band leader or a road manager, it's okay to let people muck it up. It's okay to, to let people trip up the stairs. It's okay. Um, what they need is the confidence to going to have their back. Yeah. I agree with you. That's that. what they really need, you know? Yeah. Were you playing guitar with him as well in that band or like at all? I had, I, I had a little bit of duties depending on um, who was in or who was out mm -hmm. uh, at a particular show. Um, and uh, over time, um, as you know, my grandfather um, had cancer uh, at the end oh, of his sorry. life. And so, the once I started to get to a place where I could play and find that confidence, um, he was starting to phase out his career. Um, so we never really had the big jam session <laughs> that you would that you would like to see that story finale yeah. with. Um, but there, most of the time when I would get involved in play was in practice sessions. Uh, okay. There was an old gas station in the town that was closed, and so. Um, the guys would just sort of like if we didn't have something to do on a weekend they would go to that gas station everybody would sit around the old gas pumps in folding chairs and and just play and and jam and like oh hey i heard this song and i'm trying it out or hey can let's play this song and it was just people sitting around playing and and no big deal and and nobody was trying to make any money on those weekends and it wasn't a formal practice. Um, and I remember I brought the song Hangman Jury by Aerosmith to the circle because That's I thought so it was funny. a cool I know song. That song. It's a great song. I, yeah. And I, I was like, I want to, I, I, this would be great. This would Not be great. Not an easy song to play either. No, <laughs> Very <laughs> syncopated not. rhythms. If I remember in the beginning of that too. Yeah. yeah. And, and I remember, um, it's just me sitting there singing it and trying to break it down for them to teach it to them. None of them had heard it. I mean, we're talking about guys, the average age of that band was, you know, 75. 
<laughs> like, there's a bunch of old guys sitting around. No, there's no banjo old... in this one. <laughs> no, there's no, there's no banjo here. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, uh, you know, there, it, it was really, you know, this generational speak and everything. And they thought it was some, you know, old blues song from the forties or the thirties that they hadn't heard before. They thought, wow, how did she find this? And I was like, it's Aerosmith. And they were suddenly, they were like, well, we don't, well, now we don't want to learn it, but the song is intriguing. Maybe we do. And, you know, I kind of introduced Aerosmith to this, to these, this group of guys that were like, wait. And the next thing I know, a few years later, they're talking about, you know, these same guys are talking about Slash. That's so they're funny. They're talking about, you know, they're talking, they've never, they, this kind of opened a door for them to go, oh, all new music isn't crap, you know? Right. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, this Eddie Van Halen guy that my kid listens to or my grandkid listens to, maybe I ought to listen and holy, holy cow, he's a great guitar player, you know? Right. And so that was kind of um, a revelation to me about, about how much distance there can be in generations when you're talking about music and how much yeah. you can miss if you don't just listen, just listen and, you know and see what's out there. I, it's funny when I said there's no banjo, I actually think there is a banjo in the beginning of that intro, as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I, no. after I said that, I was like, no, I think Maybe. there is there in the I very beginning. it could be a banjo. Yeah. I think it could be is. played on banjo. Um, I agree with you though. Joe Perry is one of the, the most unique, Mm -hmm. I mean, like the most unique players ever. He doesn't, you know, he kind of plays in the blues realm, but he doesn't play any kind of standard. Yeah. He's phenomenal. He really is just phenomenal. I don't think he gets recognized for how much he moved the needle for rock, and for, for guitar in general. I think oh, he's I agree. an unsung hero for for a lot of of the way rock music has developed from the seventies into the eighties and, and what we know now, I don't think we would have slash. I don't think we would have, uh, I don't think we would have, uh, you know, Dave Grohl. I don't yeah. think we would have some of these big guys had it not been for, you know, the influence of Joe Perry and, yeah. um, and, and also Brad Whitford. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. He I think those two guys anywhere near enough. Yeah those two guys are just sort of out there and, and they get overlooked and, you know, I'm always like raising that banner for Joe and for Brad Good. to say, you know, Hey guys, like, listen to this. These, these guys are here, yeah. you know? And, um, it, it kicks me in the butt every single time a list of like top 100 guitarists comes out and Joe's not even like in the top 25 or something. And I'm like, who is making this list? Like, where uh, are people you? People that what look at social like? media at currency. Yeah. That's probably what it is nowadays. Probably, yeah. A lot of it. That and Sister Rosetta Tharp. Yeah, she was awesome. She played an SG. She played that white SG you got right behind you, didn't and she? And she did. That is yeah. that is the um the replica that came out a yeah. few years ago. Um that's cool. she um you know that's my grandfather was the person that introduced me to Sister Rosetta Tharp's music, and he told me, he was like, this is the woman that invented rock and roll. That's you know, pretty cool. Chuck Berry's from Missouri, and so everybody would talk about Chuck Berry in that area, or they would you know, talk about all this kind of stuff. And, and my grandfather, who had no way to show me video or you know, thing, he had an old record, and he was like, this is the person that invented rock and roll. And um, Attention musicians, composers, artists, and songwriters. If you have a burning desire to get involved with the current explosion of opportunities in music licensing and take your income to the next level, then you must listen to this. A new free training video has just been released which shows you how to make your first placement in music licensing or if you've already made some placements but you don't have a specific system to make more placements more consistently, you'll learn how to do this as well. This free video training is called Where the Money's Hiding in the Music Business and you can find it online at musicreboot.com. This video shows you how to create the financial stability you've always wanted and how to take advantage of the current explosion of opportunities in music licensing due to streaming and the internet. So check it out online now at musicreboot.com. I preach that gospel every chance I get. 
<laughs> Every That's time cool I that your somebody, grandfather like, turned you on to this, all this music. He did. Yeah, he turned really me good. on to just like all, he didn't have, he didn't discriminate upon genre. He did until I, until I had presented that example of why you should listen to what's on the radio now. <laughs> um, he did sort of discriminate based on like when it came out on time sure. frame. Yeah. But once, once he started to realize that like, these are the, these are the people that were influenced by the music I loved. And I can hear that in what they're playing. That was something I figured out was if you feel like you're stuck listening to a particular artist, or you feel like you're stuck in a genre or whatever, go backward, listen to the influencers of the person you're listening to. Yeah. And then listen to the who influenced them and who influenced them. Go all the way back and then come forward again in another direction. You know, yeah, most inevitably, you're going to end up at Sister Rosetta Tharp. So instead of going to that she influenced Chuck Berry, go to she influenced someone else and follow who they influenced and work your way back to the current times. Yeah. And you will find that you love a lot more genres and a lot more styles than you think you do and it's so much fun to go and learn all that stuff oh it's amazing yeah it's so it's cool. amazing yeah so 18 your your grandfather passes mm -hmm. musically like was it at that point you felt you wanted a career in music or what did you want to do with this music thing at that point i wanted a career in music the moment i heard joe perry play live I knew I wanted. I I'm going to be involved. He was in your he was your Ed Sullivan Beatles story. Yes, he was six yeah, years that's old. So cool. I am going. I am going to. I don't know what, but I am going to be involved in music. Music is going to be a part of my life subconsciously. That's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, and I always gravitated towards it. It being a big part of my life. Um, but I didn't understand fully. I knew there was a, a business around it. I understood that there was a business. I un as I grew up, I understood. Okay, there's uh, there are executives and there are producers and there are engineers. I was a big reader of liner notes. I had a notebook that I kept under, you know, in between my mattresses that I would write down everything like. I'd write down that Jack Douglas was a producer on this album. And then when I would be out in the world, I would look for like, was this produced by Jack Douglas? Was this produced by Jack Douglas? Oh, and then I would start to make connect dots of different session musicians, different right. songwriters. Um, that was fun for me. It was a puzzle for me, a distraction for me when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. Okay. Um, you know, and that was, it was, it was fun. I didn't always get to buy that music. Uh, rarely did I get to buy music, but when I would be out and about, you know, at a store or, or something, I could see the liner notes, the credits on the back of most albums and, and connect the dots. And then I could listen for it on the radio. Yes. And, you know, most of my music that I had that was recordings was where I had recorded it off of the radio with my tape player, with the tape player smashed against the radio. Yeah, I remember. The, I, t I used to do that, yeah. yeah. And, a little radio um, shack. Yeah. So I, that, was, that was the bulk of my music library. And, right. Um, so I, you know, I'd be listening to the radio and I would go, okay, that's that artist. And that was also produced by the same guy that produced this other person and, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I wish we had better you, credits today. You know? Oh, I, that when 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 records went to when vinyl switched to CD, that was my biggest regret mm -hmm. because I'm yeah. like you, and and I think probably most people listening to this are similar. You know, I used to be mesmerized, and you know, and then you had to, all of a sudden it boiled down to it was just not the same engagement that an album yeah. vinyl provided you. When when CDs came out, you were lucky if you got executive producer on the outside where you could read it. You it were just, lucky if you got that. It, it, and it, it, yeah, yeah, it was frustrating. It was fun. It was yeah, really it was really frustrating. frustrating. It, yeah. it was this little sheet of paper you had to like, 
you know, look for it. It was just not cool. Like, like, vinyl oh, and was. even as in my early 20s, I needed like a magnifying glass to read the inside of most CDs. Oh, now forget it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So at that time, I, I want to ask you about one thing you said because this is unusual. You said, I understood there was a business. How did that yeah. get in your head? Um, well, I always, I always tried to figure things out. Like I said, a lot of this was a puzzle to me to figure out. And I was like, well, if I never see, I'm going to go back to Jack Douglas. I never see Jack Douglas as a producer, as, as an artist. So he must do something. What does a producer do? Um, what does an engineer do? And these people have to have places where they go to do their jobs. You know, okay. um, my, my uncle, uh, Bob Meredith, you can, uh, hopefully someday you'll be able to find the Bob Meredith Trito on Spotify. If I can ever get the, if I can ever get it released. <laughs> um, and, uh, it's uh, it's just this, um, he would go into the studio and I was fortunate enough to go in the studio and I was like, I don't know why. I don't know how I knew that like, this is a place of business. Like, yeah, that's really is, unusual. And it may have been because of where it was located. It wasn't in somebody's house. It was actually in a building somewhere. And, um, and so I think I just got this impression that, you know, there, there is a business to it. Now, the extent of my knowledge of that business was as far as like, okay, there's a studio and you've got to go there and you've got to rent this time and you've got to pay for it. And you take your tapes when you go and all those kinds of things. And for some reason, I was hardwired to understand that that was what business is, a commodity that's bought and sold. Um. And then I started to see, you know, I would see songwriters names and then I would see publishing names, but I, they would, you know, Universal, Warner Chapel, BMG, Sony, EMI. Um, and I knew that those were businesses um, and they would be specific, you know, Universal Music Publishing, uh, Warner Brothers Music versus Warner Chapel Music. What does that right. mean? And those were all things that I would try to investigate and try to understand. Um, wow, that's pretty And ask questions insightful. because I was like, yeah. these are companies and companies have employees. And what do those employees do? And I didn't always get the answers. I didn't really get the answers to all of that until I went to Belmont. Right. Um, but, you know, I even understood that radio stations were a business. You know, that's pretty amazing. So, I mean, it's like yeah. a, a gift of source to tell you the truth. Probably it's, you know, it was the gift. I didn't get the gift of being able to play like Joe Perry, but I got the business head. Who has that so. gift? <laughs> Not, Not many people. anyone I know. <laughs> Not anyone I know. So you went to Belmont and studied music, right? Mm -hmm. Music business. Music business, not music. Two different right. departments entirely. One of the first programs in the world that distinguished itself as music business. And, and you were probably one of the early grads of that program, no? Uh, that program, um, I think, you know, it was coming into its own I was, okay. I, um, in, in the uh, early 90s, mid 90s, when I was there in Nashville. Hmm. And, uh, I mean, there had already been, I mean, um, Trisha Yearwood had graduated and had become successful. She was an early graduate, um, Shelby Kennedy songwriter in Nashville, amazing songwriter, um, had graduated. Um, so I think, uh, I think we were probably at least 10 or 15 years in to the okay. program, uh, when I got there. Um, it's still growing, and what it's grown into now is just unbelievable. It's huge. The, and, is Belmont, is it? Yeah. Huh. The number of music business programs in general has grown. And, and well, the identifying. Better, because it, yeah. these people mm -hmm. nowadays, they're not going to get a record company to handle anything for them. So they better learn no. on their own. And you have to understand 
you know, this is the thing that I try to instill into every songwriter or every musician I meet is that nothing is set it and forget it. Just because you sign a publishing contract or an admin agreement or a record label deal, they're going to throw money at you. They're going to, they're going to, gonna, you know, if you, if you allow it, they will pat you on the head. But you have to inquire. That communication has to be there. You have to communicate with them. You have to tell your administrator or your publisher when you've written new songs and who you've written them with so that they can have your back and do their job on your behalf. You have to communicate with your label, you know, and, and if you want to have a featured artist, there's, I, I remember talking to an artist in Nashville and, um, and he was like, yeah, I, I signed my deal and I, um, you know, I want to be, I want to be in the room with, with this list of songwriters and, and, and write with them and learn with them. And I'm like, okay, well, have you <laughs> talked you to your label? <laughs> have you told anybody, have you had those discussions with them about who would be good and how to work up to, I mean, cause you're talking about like Jeffrey Steele and stuff. And I don't think you're going to get that meeting today today yeah but you can work your way up and like have you talked to them yeah but they you know i don't know i don't know who to call over there and i'm like you should find out find yeah. out who to call find out who to talk to and as much as you fight to learn how to play as much as you struggle as much as in day in the early days when you got blisters and calluses on your fingertips you got to carry that fight that fight through those calluses and that fight through understanding tuning and, and all of that, you got to carry that all the way through to other parts of your career. It's within you to do it because you've done it with this thing. Carry that forward. And the successful, the really successful artists and songwriters I've seen understand how to carry that forward, um, how to carry that fight through it. And that I gotta passion that, for it. This is probably one of the best advice, some of the best advice I've had a guest give cool. because you're so right. And unfortunately, yeah. I'm a business person. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. direct opposite. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I sort of have left and right brains engaged. I have no clue how, and I have no clue how long it's going to last either at this point. But, um, most creative people are allergic to this stuff yeah. and instead of which is fine but you still need to pursue exactly what you said how does the how do we make this happen right you know and how then you got to get answers and you know are people mm -hmm. going to get angry i don't know it doesn't matter it's your right <laughs> you Listen, know i'll say the most controversial thing i think that i say out there and that is um you as an artist or as a songwriter, you don't work for the label. You don't work for the publisher. They work for you. You are their the, boss. Which way is the cash flowing? Exactly. And, exactly. Uh, and, and that requires you to, to communicate with them. You have that power and that responsibility. I'm not going to quote the movie. <laughs> but you have both of those things. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, we, I was talking about traditions with someone and traditionally there is this vibe in the music industry that songwriters work for publishers. And, and there are cases in our history of our industry where that was very true. Sure. We were a songwriter that worked for a publisher Right. And there are some times when that is still true in some respects, um, in certain deals. But in general, um, I firmly 100% believe that our clients are my boss. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. And I, am, I work for them. It is my job to go get and find those pennies out there everywhere and get them for you. And that's yeah. not a sales pitch. I'm not saying that as a sales pitch for exploration. I'm saying that that's the way I believe the industry should work. And a lot of other independents think that way. 
I've had a lot of people in the industry look at me and go, well, yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah. And I'm like, so go clean your own house and make it that way because your yeah. house isn't clean that way. Person who's trying to scold me. Yeah. Um, and uh, I see a lot of messy houses. Person who's that, trying to scold me. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. But I've, I've, I've genuinely sat in front of a room and said that to a crowd of, of people and a, on a panel and have executives from big companies come and be like, no, no, that's the way we are. You don't understand who we are. That's the way we are. And I look at them and I go, how much money did your investors give you in that last round of right. stuff? Right. And how many people did you lay off? Right. And, and all those things, you need those humans to do the work. You need those humans to be able to talk to your writers. And it's one of the reasons that exploration didn't take any investment money. I didn't want any investment money. The only people I want to be my boss are my songwriters. I get really passionate about this. So I feel like I'm getting like fiery. No, but um, I think it's a very valid thing. And I think this whole mm -hmm. thing, like uh, my daughter's 23 and she had to hire a lawyer for something recently. And, and she was like, well, I don't want to, I feel awkward. I don't want to call him too many times. I'm like, why? I was like, he works for you. I said, he works for you. Which mm -hmm. way did cash flow here? And she goes, yeah. you know, dad, you're right. I never looked at it. I'm like, yeah, don't let this asshole intimidate yeah. you because he's got a you know, he's, you know, he thinks he's better than everybody. That's his problem, yeah. not yours. I said, he's working for you. You're paying his bills. And he, if he don't be, if he's not appreciative and grateful, you got to fire him and get another one. That's true. That's I, true. I, I'm, I'm a firm believer they, of that. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, don't I agree let the with you fact, there. don't let the fact that you get royalty checks or that you get a 1099 at the end of the year for those royalty payments. Don't let that, uh, confuse the fact that you are actually paying your administrator a commission. Correct. Yeah. And I think that sometimes when you see the, the money flow on the surface, you see, oh, they pay me royalties. Oh, I get a 1099. When the reality is, is that's just the mechanics of how it works. <laughs> yeah, you're the paying this much and they're is, giving you. Yeah, yeah. The core of it is you're paying them a commission. Sure. You're paying them for a mm -hmm. service to be a third party administrator. Yeah. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so happy you mentioned that because, again, when I talk with so many musicians and like, you know, I'll even have people come on the show. I'm like, hey, do you have anything to promote? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, didn't you come out with a new album? And I'm like, yeah, but I don't want to, I don't want to be like, pushing it i'm like hey man it is not gonna sell itself push it, it you know push you it. are here let me push mm -hmm. it then you know i mean yeah. like it's almost like there's an awkwardness about or like a i feel dirty if i try to sell something why if you're selling something that was based on the sweat sure. of your brow yeah you i hope you it's feel good art. about selling that yeah it's, it's your, your art. art it's your passion yeah. it's your, i agree with you it's your creative output and you know I don't, you know, God, Buddha, whoever is out there, the universe in general, all the good juju, whatever it is out there, you have that creative spirit in you. And you have that creativity in you. You have that gift. And you choose to do something with it and and to express it and there's a part of you that wants people to listen to it wants people to hear it wants to go play in front of people you're not selling out you shouldn't feel dirty about promoting yeah. yourself or promoting your album absolutely or promoting your your songwriting because that's why you're here Correct. That's why you're here. And that Im that fear of selling out, that imposter syndrome. I've struggled with imposter syndrome. I struggled with it. I'm going to be just totally like rip off the band-aid. I was having imposter syndrome this morning, getting dressed and getting ready to do this interview because I'm looking and thinking about the list of people that you've interviewed. I don't fit into that. Oh my God, this is going to be embarrassing. This is going to be, you know, and then oh, I just kind of had to me? like whack whack myself and go listen 
You've been in this business for over 40 years, Missy. You know yeah. this business. Of course you do. You yeah, know yeah. what you're doing. And even myself, it takes a minute. And you got to remember that even Beyonce has a moment where she's like, has to look in the mirror and go, look, bitch. Yeah. You're Beyonce. You know, <laughs> like everybody has that. That's moment. great. Everybody has those feelings. <laughs> and you were put here and you choose to use your gift to express something, to fight for something, to speak for something. Do it. That was great. That was great. Thank you. That was really good. Thanks for sharing that too about your mm -hmm. own. Uh, I'm a good uh, cheerleader for some, for my songwriting. Beers and, and <laughs> sometimes. Hey, I think everybody has. You know, look, we all have moments of highs and lows. You know, mm -hmm. and that's just the reality of being a human being. Yeah. Okay, so you go to Belmont. After Belmont, you worked in a few different aspects of the music business. Yes. And you found artist management and publishing were two niches you particularly enjoyed. Mm -hmm. What about those areas of business appealed to you most at that particular time? And as a part two to that, what aspects of your personality, what skill sets did you have made you such a good fit to, to perform well in those areas? Um, yeah, I went into artist man management because I was delusional and thought I knew how to do it. <laughs> That's literally it. It was a That's moment of it. delusion. <laughs> I it was total delulu. That's great. I I look, I had worked for, you know, over a decade with some guys who were very mature adults. <laughs> you mean and these your your grandfather's the, Yeah, with my grandfather's band, yeah. band and those musicians and some of them were younger and some of them had some issues and, you know, speed bumps, but in general, I'm dealing with adults who had jobs, who had families, who had responsibilities, who knew how to do their own laundry, pick up after themselves, be at places on time, had a valid driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny, the details you're breaking. They did their own laundry. Hey, I don't think my kid does that yet. <laughs> well, you know, listen, and, and, uh. <laughs> and then you go into, then you go to Nashville and you think, oh, I've, I've done tour management stuff. I was tour right. manager by the time that all ended. I was a tour sure. manager. And that was great. And I worked the soundboard at that little shithole in, <laughs> in the middle of the woods. I know what yeah, I'm doing. Yeah. Right. I know how to load, load in, load out. I know how to do these things, except the biggest variable was everybody was under the age of 25. All right. And now I'm like, I'm not dealing with scheduling and planning and working with people who have been adults for a while and have a common goal. Okay. I'm dealing with my fellow college students or some that aren't in college and some of them have real serious problems. Sure. And some of them can't keep a valid driver's license. Some of them can't keep clean clothes on their bodies, not for a lack of everybody pointing it out to them. Right. You know, some of them have finals that overlap with the schedule. Sometimes the lead person in the band can't decide if they're a rock band or a Christian band. Hmm. You know, there's all these challenges and it was really hurting cats. Yeah. Right. Hurting, I can see that. And it wasn't just, you know, management is about hurting cats. But sure. this was like hurting feral monsters. <laughs> there you go right there. <laughs> yeah. It's about hurting feral, feral cats born to wolves. Yeah. And, you know, in the wild. And even having a band that could come together as a, a unit with a common goal. Five five band members come to you together with a common goal was a struggle. Wow. For me. Anyway, look, sometimes you fall into it. I know managers that are like tripping over people who are talented and together and all these things. That was not my experience. And sure. thank God it wasn't yeah. um, because I wouldn't have went down the road of music publishing. 
Um, and so I found that math was really good. I was really great at math. I always was. I, which will help you in any career you go into. Oh God. Yeah. I know. Um, and I found that I liked to, I was really great at bringing order to chaos. So how can I do that and not run you're, out of you're my in the own right money. business? That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And not, not run out of money and feed myself and and how how can I have a good life and bring order out of chaos and and work with math and spreadsheets and things that I I'm really good at and I um I was uh, I had gone back to work for the dean at Belmont at the music business program Dr Pamela Brown who's an amazing attorney I love her with all my heart she um, she took me in. <laughs> when I was struggling to be a manager and gave me a paycheck <laughs> and, um, and Leticia Alvarez, who's now at wise music, um, had come in to visit her uh, and she lived in Los Angeles. She had been a senior at Belmont when I was an incoming freshman. And uh, I didn't know her at that time, um, but she came in and, and she visited with Dr. Brown for a while. And then she, um, I don't know what came over me, but as she started to leave, I printed out my resume and I handed it to her and I shook her hand and I said, if you have any job openings in Los Angeles, let me know. I'll move. Just like spur of the moment like that? Just, I don't know. I don't know what came over me. I was like, what is happening right now? Wow. And um, I knew that she worked in publishing and for an independent publisher. And I knew enough from, from what I knew at Belmont and everything I had learned that that was an indie publisher and that I probably wanted to be in an indie publishing place. I didn't really want to go corporate. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, just like some wave of delusional confidence came over me in the moment and turns out it wasn't delusional because Leticia was going to throw it away, but woke up late for her flight the next day and just threw everything, including my resume into her suitcase came back to Los Angeles, goes into a meeting with her boss and, and her boss, Karen at windswept says, you know, Hey, we've got this project and we probably need to hire somebody temporary to like deal with this thing. Holy smoke. And Leticia is like, I, I might know somebody. And she goes home, rips my resume out from this suitcase where she's crammed it and calls me and says, Basically, if you move to LA, I'll give you this job. Holy crap. So a few weeks later, I loaded up everything I owned. I hopped across the country in a U-Haul with a friend of mine who wanted to make the same journey and called Leticia and said, um, hey, so I moved. Um, do I get that job? And she was like, oh, shit, I didn't think you were going to do it. <laughs> 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 oh, so you moved like you didn't even say to her, hey, uh, you know what? Thanks for letting me know. I'm leaving next Thursday. You didn't. You just like left. and I, I kind of did, but I don't think she, wow. I don't think Leticia, like, I, it didn't I, register I don't think that it was real. didn't register that it was yeah. real. And, um, and I did, you know, have in the back of my mind that like the job could not, might not be real or it might be not a livable wage or it might be for like two months. Like I, I knew that like it was going to be, I was going to, this was going to be rebuilding a new life for myself, which I was right. ready for the challenge of. And, um, because I was confident that I could go back to Nashville and, and get a gig. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I had that confidence, whether it was confidence or whether it was delusion that part, I don't know. I'm going to go with confidence on that. Yeah, one. I think it was confidence. Yeah. And, um, and so I go in and she, it took her a few weeks to like actually get her budget and actually get everything straight and ready to go. But I started at Windswept and, um, and when that cleanup project was ended, I, um, she asked me, she was like, I am going to have a job as a copyright assistant. 
but I have to do all of the company things. I have to do all the managerial things and get my budget and show them that I have the work for a body and all these kinds of things. Will you please stay and just file things in the mailroom, keep the mailroom clean, do some odds and ends? Will you stay for that? I will pay you until I can get this job description together and get this push through. And I didn't have anything else to do. So I said, yes. Wow. And so there was this tenuous about a month of like, okay, am I going to have a job tomorrow or not? Yeah. And, um, but it was such a great opportunity. You know, there's something about that that sounds deflating and like tedious What's and that? boring uh, what? about, you know, going to the file room after, you know, doing this big project for the UK office. There's something that might sound deflating or might sound like, oh, crap about it. That doesn't but sound it deflating. Wasn't. No, it sounds it was, exciting. It sounds like a little scary. But, you know, wh listen, petrified. people think people think and I want to point this out because, you know, mm -hmm. Pat on your back because people are afraid to do things. Yes. And they really are. Nothing happens if you're afraid. If you it, don't and, move, and, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. And and they're like, well, if I wasn't afraid, I would do it. But that's not how life works. You do it mm -hmm. and then you get the courage. Courage comes from <laughs> like movement, you mm -hmm. know? And then you're like, yeah. holy shit, I did this. Now I'm more courageous for the next time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really not the other not way about around. Like thing. I'll do it when I'm more confident. It's really not about the thing because you can figure yeah. it out. You know, absolutely. I want to, I want to go from the parking lot at the top of the grand Canyon to the bottom. It's not about having the courage to jump off of there to land at the bottom. It's about having the courage to move and figure out and work right. your way down to the river at the bottom of the grand Canyon. Same right. thing coming back up to the top. It's not about, it's, it, it's the same thing as we talked about at the very beginning. What did I, the biggest lesson takeaway from my grandfather was he let me figure it out. As long yeah. as that case didn't drag the ground, he didn't care how I accomplished it. Absolutely. And I had the, I didn't have the courage to carry the guitar. I had the courage to not let it drag the ground. Yeah. Right. And wow. That's awesome. L let me ask you something else. When things like that happen, because this was, you know, you basically did some, and we all do this at some level of every day, getting in mm -hmm. our car and making a left instead of a right. There's a, a there's some mm -hmm. free will involved in your destiny, right? Um, right? But you did something that really changed your life. I mean, yeah. completely yeah. changed your life, right? Mm -hmm. How do you look at stuff like that? Are you like a spiritual person or do you just look at, hey, I was in the right place, right time or a combination of or or do you don't even think about it and you just say, hey, I'm happy it happened. You know, what is your thought process about things like that? I, um, I tend to think that the, we have some guidance, but I definitely, definitely believe that free will is the primary thing we have. Yes. Um, I have seen, I've seen too many people with the skills and the drive get disheartened and make different choices that took, that skewed them. Um, and, and so I believe that like you were, you were put here, we're put here to do something. And I think we're put here to make this world better than the way we found it. Yeah. And how the skills we are given are ours to choose to use or not to use. Um, I think there are plenty of people on the earth who have not risen to that, who just sort of like exist. It gave up. That, that gave up or maybe they didn't try. Yeah, didn't try. Often. Um, or didn't use those skills. But I think, you know, I had this drive and ambition to be a great guitar player. And that was not the plan. <laughs> right. That wasn't the plan at all. The plan was to get me so hooked 
with a passion and a love for music and for songwriters that I would become a fighter. Right. And I never saw that coming. I never saw that coming until I was in the thick of it. And it was too late to turn back. Um, and there were plenty of times when I could have turned back. There were plenty of times when I could have given up. Um, there were plenty of times when I probably should have died. But I didn't. I fought. Right. And, and, you know, that was one of those moments. Um, a lot of pivotal moments you don't recognize are pivotal. Oh, until that. Yeah, I always say until you can't connect the dots moving forward. A lot of times later. It yeah. seemed so natural and mundane to just be like, okay, well, I'm going to, it's going to be a lot of work, but I'm going to pack all my shit and move to Los Angeles. Was there any uh, cultural mm -hmm. adjustments coming from, I mean, you've been oh, in Nashville, yeah. which is, a, a, yeah. okay, tell me about that. What was like some of the funny things that like, I holy mean, shit. Nashville has grown tremendously since yeah. I left. It's brilliant. It's beautiful as it always has been. Um, I think the biggest thing was, you know, day one and you're, you know, look, Los Angeles as, as itself, it's as a city was not designed for U-Hauls <laughs> <laughs> yeah. towing a car behind them. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I mean, we're talking about somebody that never driven a U-Haul before taking, you know, hooking their car to the back of it going right. across the country. Um, but Los Angeles was, um, was not really built for that. And so I think the first time that, uh, that there wasn't a lane on the right and somebody just squeezed in between <laughs> the U-Haul and me and their little car to make the right turn kind of freaked me out. I was like, what yeah. are they doing? What are they doing? Don't scratch the U-Haul. I oh, have like a lot of money to pay if you scratch my U-Haul. <laughs> Um, that was like the first instant incident that I remember that I was like, oh, oh shit. um, there were things that my friends had told me to expect. I had friends that had moved to Los Angeles and, you know, they had told me to expect certain things. Um, and, uh, so I expected certain things. Like I had a friend of mine tell me, you know, there's an individual store for everything. You know, and I'm like, oh, and like in small towns, it's a general store yeah. for everything. And it's yeah, like a right, general right. store or it's a Walmart yeah. or it's yeah. something. And I get here and I'm like, there's a Target. What are you talking about? <laughs> there's right. an end of, like, what are you talking about? Um, the grocery store has cleaning product. Like, it's the same. There were so many things that were the same. And I had been prepped to believe the world was, it was so different. Okay. Um. I was excited to get really good. My sister-in-law is Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. And so I was excited to get really good Vietnamese food. Right. When I got yeah. here. And oh my God. Not um, a lot of that in Southern Missouri, I guess. Right? Not a lot of that in Southern Missouri <laughs> or, or in Nashville. Although I hear there's some, you know, Nashville is expanded. Nowadays, yeah. It's, it's pretty, Nowadays, pretty yes, contemporary. But in yeah. the mid nineties, not <laughs> so much. Not much. Yeah. I'm sure there was a hole in the wall that I never found. Yeah. But, but I hear you. Um, I, yeah. I feel you on that. Yeah. Uh, okay. So how did you, you, you're at Windswept, mm -hmm. right? What did that company do? And then how'd you wind up becoming head of West Coast licensing at BMG? And hang on one second. I just got to turn that fan off now. I got cool sure. here. Hang yeah. on. All right. Sorry about that. I know. Okay, so, yeah. time to take a big drink. Oh, you can take a big drink whenever you want. Okay. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. how, what did Windswept do and how did you wind up becoming head of West Coast Licensing at BMG? Uh, dumb luck and hard work. Um, and, and Leticia Alvarez being the best boss I could ever have asked for and mentor. Still consider her uh, an ally and a mentor to me. That's great. Even now. Um, Leticia fought for us. She fought for the writers. And we watched her. We watched her fight for the songwriters. They'd sign a new deal. She, she would get their catalog. And, you know, 
break it down. Like we got to get the LODs out right now. We got to get the LODs out. We need this money to come here. We need to fix these LOD. databases, uh, letters of direction. So okay. when you purchase a catalog or you or catalog changes administrators, most of the time you should have a letter of direction, which tells all the sources of money, hey, this is my administrator now, not okay. this person. This is the okay. person who should collect my money now, not that one. So when you hear and, all these big sales that are going on nowadays, everybody gets a letter of, a letter of direction for this. Be, there should be letters of direction that go okay. out. And, you know, and the timings are different depending on, you know, the MLC has its own timeline of payout. Uh, sub publishing might have uh, a post term collection period because it takes a long time to get the money from some territories to back all the way routed back to a place. So there'll be different collection periods that have to time out. But the okay. letter of direction will tell you money as of this date, money as of this period should now go to this place. Okay. Case in point, um, the MLC, when they pay out, they pay out. Who's the MLC? They, for, um, for... Use, uh, Mechanical Licensing Collective. Okay. Was started as a part of the MMA. It makes the most headlines right now in terms of paying out mechanicals to songwriters and publishing uh, from the various DSPs for interactive streaming, like okay. Spotify. Um, and so they pay out, um, we get money from them in April. That's for the January period that was reported to them. So Spotify reports their January earnings to the MLC, and that money comes to us in April. So okay. if we send a letter of direction that says, as of April 1, the money comes to exploration, that means the April period of right. money starts coming to exploration. So the MLC is probably not going to start to pay us until July or August. Or July. Something. Yeah. Because that's when April money hits them. Okay. So that's, you know, these different time frames. But if you delay in getting that paperwork moving, then you're not going to get that money at the time. Oh, you're yeah. Then you got to scramble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're scrambling. So it's best to like hit the ground running. Yeah. And Leticia started me in mechanical licensing for country music, which was a great place to learn because it was, you know, most of the time very simple in terms of, well, simpler in terms of like four writers on a song, 25% each, you know, things like that. So it was a great learning okay. ground. Country music is a great place to learn the basics, okay. especially older catalogs that worked in that Nashville songwriting style. Yeah. Um, and then over time I began to take on uh, other genres um, and Leticia was great because sometimes I would even completely muck it up and she would sit me down and explain what I did wrong or what wasn't actually wrong or what I did right. Case in point. Not sure how this story is going to go over. I hope Carol King knows I love her dearly, <laughs> even though this happened. Um, so Carol King's daughter released a kids album. Beautiful. Um, and one of the songs she wrote was with one of our co-writers or was co-written with one of our windswept writers and they wanted a reduced rate in terms who's, of mechanicals. Who's, who's they? Okay. This is part we're going to have to edit out because I can't remember her name. No, I don't mean the person saying, I mean, what capacity was that? But you mean the songwriter? Oh, the wanted actual, the artist. Why did they the want a reduced the rate? Label. Hmm? Why did they want a reduced rate? Well, the artist had a reduced rate, a controlled composition clause in their artist agreement with the label. Now, they're antiquated now, but controlled composition clauses in record, record contracts were basically saying, 
the record label saying, we're only going to pay 10 songs worth of mechanical royalties out to the songwriters. So if you have 12 songs on your album, we're going to take the mechanical rate per song, multiply it by 10, and that's the pool of mechanicals that we're going to agree to pay out. So this was just a con like a, a lopsided contract, or that was just what how it, was, it worked back then? It was then. the norm. It, it was, was the, the norm, standard. especially yeah. for artist songwriters, okay. because they didn't labels didn't see the value in paying their artist, who was also a songwriter, a full mechanical rate because that artist was getting an advance or that artist was getting points as an artist on their label, on their, on their sales. Sure. Um, and you can look at it as right or wrong. I think that in some cases there could be a, a, a good case made sure. for a controlled composition clause or the use of it. But the abuse of a controlled composition clause yeah. is what we dealt with most of the time. Um, and as we moved into digital and we shifted the responsibility of mechanical royalties from the record labels to the DSPs, controlled composition clause have virtually disappeared Okay. over the last 20 years. Um, but, because, let, yeah. let me, yeah. but let me ask you this. Even though those clauses have disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. The rates have shrunk so much that you probably would have still made out better with a controlled composition clause than with a DSP, no? Mm -hmm. No. Oh, okay. No. Good. We, That's great. Look, I mean, we, I think that as music publishers, we tripped ourselves up. In what way? Because several years ago, um, a copyright law me mechanical rates were adjusted to fit certain circumstances. We went from one mechanical rate to maybe if you include a mechanical rate for ringtones. So we had one or two mechanical rates and we went to like 12 based on certain circumstances. Wow. And in some cases based on percentages. So a percentage of what the label is paid becomes the mechanical amount paid to the publishing side, depending on whether or not it was a locker service, uh, a download service, um, or just streaming. And it became really, it became calculus. Yeah. To calculate what a mechanical rate would be based on, is it a bundle? Is it a family bundle? Is it an individual plan? Is it a trial plan? Is it this? Is it that? That all became factors. Whereas prior to that, it was straight up 9.1 cents per song per unit sold. Right. 10 songs on an album uh, means... 91 cents is getting paid out in total mechanicals. And explain, just for people listening who yeah. don't know mechanicals, what, explain mm -hmm. what mechanicals are. So mechanicals are traditionally tied to physical product in some way. So if, uh, if I record an album, um, then uh, uh, whoever distributes that album, the record label who owns that album, that the, the person making the money off the album is responsible to pay the mechanical right fees to the publishers and songwriters. Um, and, you know, when I was getting started, it was seven something cents per song per unit. And eventually it was, it got to 9.1 cents per song per unit. Um, and that, to me, that was always, you know, shitty right. All right. You know, why so couldn't we ever break the 10 cent mark? So if you had 91 yeah. cents on an album and you sold, mm -hmm. you know, 100, it would be, you know, $91, 100,000, mm -hmm. it would be, you know, 910,000, I guess. Yeah, you could kind of yeah. calculate. If a song yeah. went platinum, yeah. you could kind of guesstimate as a publisher or a songwriter about how much money you could reasonably expect which to is, get paid. Which is cool. Right. Yeah. You can't anymore. Yeah. You because go on of Spotify, all these, yeah. all these, all these little 
rates if it's a, like you said if it's a trial if it's a this mm -hmm. if it's a that if it's a family if it's bundle a that, yeah. if it's a family bundle you know is it ad you know youtube is it ad based is it subscription based um right you know, right and so wow. like also where were the views so you go on spotify and you go oh my god i got 100 million streams i promise you that half of those might have been in europe so your mechanicals Where they don't pay mechanicals, get, do they? They do. Your mechanicals are going to get collected by the societies mm -hmm. in those in those territories, and then they're going to come through to your society or to your sub -pub or to your publisher, and then they're going to get to you. So they take more time. Okay. I I ch I have challenges in in breaking down sometimes for some writers, like, oh, I got, I got a hundred million streams. That means I'm going to make, you know, what? A hundred thousand dollars. No. Number one, um, those streams are going to be, you know, we have to figure out how many of those are U S streams. So we can time out when you're going to get your paid. Some of those streams might be in territories where you're never going to get paid. That's truth. Um, what when you say never get paid? Why is that? If you've got, you can have people generating streams, you know, via a VPN in a territory that oh. doesn't have any agreements, doesn't have any copyright laws. Yeah, you so they have, could have something know, in Vanuatu or something, a VPN running right. out of there. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, and and so or or they're just you know maybe they're streams that just don't maybe there's not enough streams in that territory to add up to a decent amount. Yeah. Um, but calculating wow. how much per thousand streams you should make becomes a huge challenge. Oh my God. Because there are, you know, like 12 different rates potentially that could be there. Um, and that's, you know, now it's hard to estimate. It's hard to estimate. I can't look at YouTube and go, oh, there's a video that got a million views. I can't give an accurate estimation. I can, we can, we can, we can come to a general range, a conservative right. range of where right. we think the money will fall, the amount of money will fall. But anybody tell, that tells you, they can precisely tell you how much money a video that has a million views on YouTube is worth. They they can't. Yeah, can't. because of all because, these yeah. different rates involved. Where's the depending. territory? What was it? Ad view. Where territory were the views? Was it ad views or subscriber views? Was it right? Um, was it on a Wednesday at two in the morning, or was it? Uh, or was or or was it a pre roll ad? You know, was it Friday, or or was it? Um, you know, Sunday, and there was a snowstorm in most of the United States. So everybody's inside watching YouTube. Right. Ad rates are higher. And wow. So, yeah. So this is, this is be, so to some extent, it's vo not voodoo on your end because you're calculating what you get, but like from an artist like standpoint or a song. Yeah. It's like, you know, well, when they say how much you make, like, I don't know, between here and here. That's like the only industry where that probably happens. Yeah. You yeah. know, everybody else. The most you, important you get, people. Uh, yeah. The most important to the people to the industry cannot generally calculate how much they are due. Wow. Now, do you think That's this was set fight. up on purpose? N not to like intentionally steal but to intentionally make it difficult. Well, I mean, yeah, it's intentionally stealing, basically. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to impute like morals to people, but like these things don't have, why else would they happen from a practical standpoint? I think the people who were in the middle of those discussions that represented songwriters had their hearts in the right place. Yes. But at some point, you have to compromise. You right. have to get money to them. You have to get money in people's pockets. And you have to compromise at some point. You have to find some common ground 
with the people across the table, whoever those people were, however many sides there were. I don't think it was a two-sided table. I don't think it was an us, them. I think it was oh, yeah. a committee. I think it was a lot of different rep things represented, entities and sides represented at that table. And at some point, you have to move the needle somewhere. You yeah. have to make progress. And I think that some really good ideas got pushed forward. Um, and I think, look, I also think I can armchair quarterback with the best of them looking backward in time. Of course. Yeah. And, and I don't want to do that because nobody I know, truly knows. Yeah. Nobody yeah. truly knows. And you didn't know which way the industry was going to go. We didn't know that YouTube was going to be what it was yeah. when those decisions were made or what it is or how it would grow and change. It's not the same as it was when it, in 2012, when licensing started with publishers yeah. and YouTube, it's, it's changed vastly and you can't, nobody had a crystal ball to precog where the industry was going to go. So I think that the best decisions were made with the knowledge that they had and that they needed and and the spirit that something needed to happen. Right. The continuing fight for us isn't to bitch and moan about what they did or didn't do. It's nice to vent every once in a while about it. Sure. But the fight is to make improvements. The fight yeah. is to work towards more change that makes it better. And if you look at that, they, if you look at that, they were trying to cross a river together in this new version of the music industry that was happening with the emergence of streaming and downloading. If you look at the fact that maybe they threw the first big rock in and everybody could safely get to that rock. And now it's our job to to figure out what's the next rock where can we throw the next stone in this river that we can all move to to keep getting across that river and you don't know what's in that water you know how do you do it and i give a lot of credit i give a lot of credit to you know who i give a lot of credit to that a lot of people don't is metallica you know, a lot of people are like, they're jerks, or they, you know, they're mean, or they're this, or they're that, or whatever. And you get that from both sides. But Metallica stood up and said, somebody has got to do something, and we're going to have the cojones to do it. And if they hadn't have, I don't know that we would be even where we are right now. Now explain what they them, did for people who aren't familiar with that. Well, Napster became a thing. Napster was really the catalyst for where technology could potentially go. Like this, Napster was created by a guy in college in his dorm room. Yeah. And it was this place where you could go and you could upload your stuff and you could download other people's stuff. You could digitally share your music, film, TV, media. It was innovative. But he created it like, you know, it didn't create it with 50 million investors and, and 100 engineers in a room building oh, software. He's thinking about getting free music. Yeah. He's just like, <laughs> I can't. He's like, I'm in college. I can't afford shit. And I want this new album. Yeah. Or I want to be able to, you know, watch this movie. And I can't afford to go to Blockbuster because that's the reality of being in college sometimes, you know. And, and he created this thing. and it resonated with so many people and for the industry it came out of nowhere but for those of us who were in college at that time and lived through it yeah it resonated oh it was and it hit the consumers it and was it like you know we've spent yeah. decades with this smoke and mirrors of the music industry from the general public and sometimes even from artists and songwriters and now, you know, the Band-Aid's getting ripped off. And Metallica and was the first ones to go after Napster. Metallica sued Napster, and they were the first artists, the first guys to stand up and say, somebody has to do something. Oh. 
And maybe this is the right idea. Maybe it's a bad idea. I don't know. But somebody's got to do something so we can start the conversation. So we yeah. can start to move the needle. So we can start to do something and start to understand this problem. And, yeah. and I don't think it was just them being jerks. We have to start the thing that they really exposed that I think was important for the music industry was we have to start educating the consumers. Yes. Their fans yeah. turned on them. They took all the hits for everybody. They got kicked in the nuts by everybody and they took it all alone as artists out there. And that wasn't fair. And they don't get enough credit for doing that because now we have educated, we have more education to our consumers of music, more education to songwriters, more education to artists, to lawyers, to publishers, to mailroom people. The key to all of this and improving it is education. Yeah. And it started because Metallica had the, had the nerve to, to stand up and say, okay, somebody has got to do something. That's a that's a very great point that you made. It, it really is because if they hadn't, who, I you get know. I get heat for that. Why <laughs> I get heat for that point of From view? Who? I don't know why. Uh, I don't know. Just people that don't like Metallica, and you know they're rough around the edges. But what else but this, do you expect? But this From is a some business. Hardcore metal guys. You know? This is a business. I mean, yeah, but that's irrelevant. That's you know what kind of music they play and what their personalities anyway, what are. What they is play, irrelevant. who yeah. they are, as individuals, it doesn't take away from the fact that they were yeah. the ones who raised their hand to do it. Yeah, to put and a stop to this. Nobody, right. nobody in the industry had their back. They took all the lumps for that. Wow, all the lumps themselves. Yeah, Renee, let's. I want to talk about exploration because. Shit. You provide a wide range of services, and if you can, in layman's terms, explain the primary service that you guys provide, and as well, who who would be your ideal clients you can serve that would benefit most from working with you? Yeah. So exploration is basically copyright administration, and what that means is. If you are the creator of, or the owner of, or the inheritor of copyrighted material such as music or video content or uh, film or TV content, we can offer you support to make sure that you are getting paid from various sources within the industry that are generating money that belongs to you. Example. As as, as I can put it. Example. So, so like you said, video content, mm -hmm. like I'm a video yeah. content creator. Yeah. So would mm -hmm. a guy like me, I mean, I'm, you know, a, a small drop in the bucket. Potentially, if you wanted some support, uh, we do one of our services is channel management on YouTube because that can be arduous in terms of um, dealing with if you've got a channel that starts to go big or you're a music artist with a channel and, you know, you're just like, oh, I post my music videos when I create them. You know, if, if you want that channel to grow and to be a source of income at some level of real money, a lot of times people need support. The best YouTubers in the world who make a lot of money have an editor. They have a, an assistant, an uploader, mm -hmm. a producer sometimes, researchers, those types of things. And so um, we can provide some support in managing the channel on YouTube's system, managing the back end. Right. Most creators have a good handle on the front how to upload their video, how to tag it, those types of things. We do offer tips and tricks because YouTube is a fast-paced, growing world. And sure is. You know, it makes tweaks and changes to those things all the time. But where we offer, I think, the most value is in the back end because you're, even in posting this video to YouTube, you're creating an asset within YouTube's content ID system. Sure. And that asset is going to have metadata and a digital fingerprint. And that digital fingerprint that is created when you upload this video is 
is going to get compared to every other fingerprint of sound recording, film, TV, everything that's out there. Um, wow. And if there is a match made between your video and one of those digital finger tr fingerprints, a claim is going to get made by that asset, which is an entry in the database, onto your video. 99.999 .999 to infinity times out of 10, it's okay. It's just going to be a copyright claim and the claim, the, the asset that claimed made the claim on your video is going to get paid instead of you. Right. Occasionally. Um, I think there's some things going on with queen right now that seem a little weird, but occasionally there will be a miscommunication maybe between a label or a distributor or something maybe publishing changes hands and somebody forgets to take care of YouTube or something like that. And uh, you will find um, something might get issued a takedown or a block. Right. In those situations, if someone has a video that's been taken down or, or a block, simply communicate with the asset owner that's made a claim. Because most of the time, we want your video to stay up. We want and your so you will communicate. To stay up. You'll communicate with the person who's made the claim. We don't always That's have the you bandwidth because of the volume of claims that happen. We don't always have the bandwidth to reach out. But if someone lets us know, hey, I don't understand why this was a takedown. We usually have a reason from the client that it's a takedown, and we can okay. explain that to the channel owner, like. This is the reason. Gotcha. Um, you you got a hold of something that was leaked, or you know, or this artist was like that was a you know you loved that concert that you went to and took the video with their iPhone, but the artist was really struggling that day and does not like their performance, and so we that's why we're blocking your video, you know, and and things like okay. that. Things like that have happened. That's actually a case, a real world scenario that happened. And um, once we explained it to the channel uploader, they were like, but she was great. She sounded great. She sounded amazing. And we take that feedback back to the artist. And she was like, no, I was, I messed up and I looked terrible and I was having a horrific day. And we're like, but your fans didn't see it. This is what your fans saw. This is what this fan experienced. And she was like, okay, maybe don't block it. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe I was seeing something internally that I didn't, that wasn't really out there to be seen. And so once those communication lines are open, you really find it's easy to resolve these issues. Um, and do we run up against people that don't understand why? We're not going to let your maybe controversial content be paired with our client's music. Yes, there are some people that don't understand that. But um, we try to always be kind and polite about it and try to explain the why to somebody that has a question. But I encourage people to reach out if they don't understand, either through disputing the claim or an email and just to say, you know, hey, I don't understand why this exists. Can we talk about it? And I promise you, my people will be like, of course we can talk about it. Thank you for asking. You know? Yeah. So Most you places best... are not like that. If you get a claim from somebody else, they're, they're not going to be that open to it. To, to trying to help you and work yeah. it out. Yeah. Yeah. So you best serve content creators in the in the music arena who mm -hmm. need to want to make sure they're getting paid on everything and who, Correct. yeah. Okay. I get you. Mm -hmm. From um, all the sources, not just YouTube, but your so, content was primarily where we could probably help you. Maybe help you if you were looking for support would be YouTube would be the place right. where we could help you. Mm -hmm. So let's say question for you mentioned someone recording a concert. Mm hmm how does that work now if someone's recording somebody else's material that they created that they own and now you're displaying it on your video mm -hmm. how is do, does 
does YouTube or wherever they the, take that money and funnel it to the license holder or the owner? Because I've had situations where a guest will be on the show, he or she will pick up their guitar and they'll play like an exercise, like, you know, GBD or so, some exercise. And YouTube will then flag that and say, this is a cop. something. It right. matches to something. It was literally an exercise. And I'll be like, what? And, you know, it's not worth my time and effort. And we're not talking about big dollars involved here. Yeah. So I like, okay, whatever. It's worth noting that Oh Sweet Child of Mine is a fingering exercise, that in, that opening intro. Is it? Did you know that? No, I didn't. I was I just, didn't. Slash was just playing. I, Slash was just, I think it's Sweet Child of Mine. Slash was just playing an exercise on the guitar. And Axel heard him and was like, I love that intro. And, Ax and Slash is like, I'm just, dude, I'm warming up. That's <laughs> like, so funny. So, so what happened in that situation since you brought that up? Well, they wrote the, they wrote the song and released it. It was a mega hit. It was amazing. But did but, they get, was, what did they get, a, did they have to share some of that with the person who owned the copyright to that exercise? Well, I don't think anybody owned the copyright to that that particular exercise. I think it's okay. just practicing scales or something. Okay. You know, it's kind of very, very much a, a, a gray area on, you know, scales and stuff. Nobody's going to own the scales. Okay. Per se. Okay. If you do a particular arrangement of a set of scales in a particular fashion that is unique, you potentially could copyright it. but. I think in that instance, it was just basically some scales practicing. It wasn't like okay. an exercise out of a, a copyrighted manual or book. Okay. I understand what you're saying. Uh, yeah. But in the case of your video that got claimed, I would look at who the claimant was. And I would see, like, uh, is it the person that appears? Is it their publisher that made the claim? That's happened to us before where our writer has gone and done something like this. And, and then we make a claim and somebody's like, Oh, it's a, you made a claim. It was an interview that gave me permission again, communicating sure. with your publisher or your label to be like, I'm doing this thing and it's important and we're going to gratis it. Gotcha. And, okay. you know, having that communication, um, when does somebody maybe know it's an error? Hmm. I'm sorry. When does someone know when they need you? Like when, you know, for people listening to this, yeah. when does somebody know, Hey, you know, I, I need to reach out to Renee. I need to, I'm having like, what is the trigger Some that support. typically? Yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, when you start to feel overwhelmed by all the things you need to do administratively, does that make sense? So not only is there YouTube's music database that we have to maintain for our clients and all their songs um, and all their sound recordings, but there's also the MLC database to get paid for mechanicals. There mm -hmm. is your PRO database, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR, right. wherever you are. There is also... Um, a Harry Fox database, because that's how you get paid for Meta and Facebook and all oh, yeah. Instagram. There's also the Music Reports database, <laughs> where you get paid for TikTok and and certain other uh, DSPs, Peloton out there. Right. So there's all of these databases, and there's more than just that. When you start to feel overwhelmed by the amount of stuff you're doing, um. That's when you should, that's when you should reach out to start looking for an administrator. Okay. And, so if you're putting yeah. a lot of content out on all these, all these right. media, mm -hmm. DSPs, every place, if you're mm -hmm. putting loads of content out, that's when they should. And, and you, it's not, I mean, realistically, if, if you've got 50 songs out there even, and they're getting active play. That's a lot, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's a yeah. lot. Yeah. Even 25 you, is yeah. a lot. If you have, if, if you, if you feel overwhelmed or 
you have your 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 significant other is feeling overwhelmed by managing the databases. Look, if you've got 25 songs you wrote 10 years ago and that's the 25 songs you have, you can get them uploaded in the databases. Take your time, go get your accounts at each one, get them ingested, get the metadata all updated and that's pretty much easy to monitor and manage. Right? Um because you're not making a lot of new songs, but when you start to look at um at, at say an active artist that's out there touring or getting sync placements or, right. or, or is writing, you know, a lot of, maybe you're, maybe you're a, a person that's only a songwriter and you're writing with a lot of different people who have big hits, who right. are writing potential more big hits. They're going to get paid if somebody's not minding the store for you. So when you, when it, when minding the store, when minding your own store becomes too much, you hire an employee to help you mind the store. That's it. Okay. That's and then when you, you guys need to start charge a, a third party administrative fee to manage all this and make sure yes. they're, and, mm -hmm. and, and getting, make sure they're getting paid what they yeah. should be getting paid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And our biggest, the biggest two biggest differences between exploration and every other publishing administrator out there. Yeah. Right. Number on. one, this. number one, um, we have a lot more human interaction with our clients. We are not an automated, fully automated type of world. You're going to communicate with humans over here. And if you have real problems, you're going to be able to get a hold of me. Try that at some other publishing administrators. You're going to find something. You're going to struggle sometimes right. to get a hold of a human. So you're hands on with service, basically. Mm -hmm. We're very yeah, hands on. A, the second just, thing is for the listeners. Mm -hmm. This is something yeah. that Renee told me when I first spoke to her like four or five months ago. I think whenever we set this appointment up. So this is like the real deal. That was you know, mm -hmm. it's and from a work ethic standpoint that's the people you want to work with, man. You know, the, cause someone's going to go to bat for you. You know, you know, a bot is an, a bot, an automatic email isn't always going to do the job and probably will rarely do the job. Let's be real about companies using software to move big data. I think that there are incredible software tools and we as a company at Exploration have built some incredible software tools to help us get the job done. But anybody that builds software is going to tell you number one rule, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Somehow that data has got to get into that software to get moved around. And if that metadata that goes in is not cleaned up, doesn't have good songwriter names, first and last name, not AKAs, and doesn't have, you know, the percentages are all agreed to. Everybody agrees on the percentage. The IPI numbers are all there so that the PRO registration goes through right. If that data is not clean, when it goes into whatever software, you could use the greatest software ever created for yeah. music publishing. And if your data is not clean going in, it's still going to be garbage when it gets delivered wherever it's going. Yeah. And Great that's point. the thing that I struggle to get people to understand when they talk about big data. The the big publishers are sending are pushing big data and that's great because you need to handle big volumes of data to get the job done at that level. The challenge becomes how do you make sure the data is clean? Yeah. That goes into that software. And that's and how do you make sure it's clean in your own database in all the ones I listed and stays that way? stays that way and how do you make sure it takes people going and looking and doing the work scanning yeah. it sometimes you got to do the work that's the motto of my favorite wwe wrestler i told you i was gonna mention <laughs> wwe and somehow i managed to you did <laughs> yeah <laughs> sometimes so you okay, gotta you said, do the work you said there was two things that makes you guys different one is more human interaction and the second 
The second is our contracts. So when you do an admin deal in music, it is usually all or nothing. So if you go to a publisher and you ask them to be your administrator or you, you sell your publishing or you do a co-publishing deal, whatever it is, it will be all of your rights. So all your rights at all of those different databases for the territories in question. Maybe it's the U.S., okay. maybe it's the world. What exploration does is we say, you need help with just YouTube, publishing on YouTube, got you. We'll just do that. And we're not going to touch anything else. And we're not going to invoice you. We're not going to commission anything else. That works for you. YouTube doesn't. We'll fix YouTube. Uh, maybe it's, uh, we had a, a number of clients who needed help getting started with the MLC when it was came a few years ago. You need just help with the MLC, maybe HFA and maybe MRI. Okay, just those platforms. Our contract is like a dim sum menu where you just pick and choose what you want us to deal with. And then we leave the rest of it alone and we only take a commission on what we work on. And that's and not I, the way it works out. That's not the general rule. That's so awesome. But I would bet long term that serves you because people are like not defensive and they're mm -hmm. like, wow, these guys are giving me my space. Let me breathe. They're happy to do what they do. Like who doesn't want to down the line after you do a good job for six months and say, Hey, handle all my shit because this is great. Like yeah. I got to believe that's a feather, huge feather in your cap it happens. for you and for, for the clients mm -hmm. and for you. We've been able to have some, some publishers as clients who maybe they got, they got their YouTube license done their agreement with YouTube done. And then they were like, Oh my God, what is this big new database? You know, maybe we just need somebody for six months to a year to help us understand this and teach our team what to do and help us figure all of this out. And, uh, we've done that a few times for companies. Um, we did it with the MLC with a uh, songwriters and with a few publishers, indie publishers awesome. who were like, it's a whole new thing. And I don't have the time to just, do it. Can you get me started and teach me? And we were like, yeah, we can do that. Our core value, our core thing that we want to do that I want to do personally as well is to educate this industry and get everybody up to speed. I don't just want publishers to understand what we're doing or songwriters to understand what we're doing. I want all the attorneys and the managers and the mailroom guys and the vice presidents of legal at the major publishers, I want them to all have a basic working knowledge of how all of this works. And that's not always the case, unfortunately. No. So when you first meet a client, what happens? Um, What's your process? There's so many ways that clients come to us and knock on our door. Um, the, if, if someone comes to me, approaches me directly, my very first thing is I'm going to go, look, I, I'm a big fan of the show Catfish. I don't and know I've this show. I've been fooled a few times. Uh, that's where people will like, you know, you're attempting to do online dating and the person that you're dating online is actually using somebody, oh, else's yeah, somebody pictures else. and lying about oh, who they are. Man, you know what? Like literally... I don't have a massive Instagram following, but I would have to say 50 to 60% of it is catfish. And I'm like, Maybe. God, I must, I, it is. Cause I get all, <laughs> all day long. I'm getting these like, you know, pictures of young girls with two followers, like, you know, and I'm like, I, I mean, it's prolific. It's, it's mm -hmm. probably more fake than real followers. Yeah. It's, it's uh, so now I get, yeah, it's phenomenal. So I, I, it is not that I don't trust people. It's that this business is my baby and mm -hmm. I have staff to protect and I have mm -hmm. other clients to protect. So the first thing I do if I just meet someone or they just send me an email is I will do a few checks of things to see if they are who they say they are. Right. Okay. And and, and and based on that experience, I can tell you, we have received emails from potential clients who have 
sent us their their address is a Walmart parking lot. What like or why would their... someone like what is the what are they looking to get out of you? Uh, like I don't I have no idea. <laughs> so like literally like it's just somebody sitting it in their house saying how can I waste someone else's time? Like what the it could hell? Be hackers. They could be hackers. They could yeah, be scam artists. They could yeah. be, you know, it could be anything and it could come from anywhere in the world. Yeah. They could come from anywhere in the world. Um, so that's the very first thing that I do is just, I wow. will sort of just check and make sure that, that what's in the email is legit. Hmm. It's not hard to do. It's some basic, you know, if you just do basically looking at it, you can tell. Um, and then, I will usually, if it's not someone that I know or not someone that that is a referral from someone I know, right. I will hand it off to our biz dev department, and they will they will reach out, they will get they will get in touch, and they'll say, "Hey, give us some songs. We're gonna do a little check of what your songs are doing out there. We're gonna see if you're at a level where we can help you." Okay. Because like if audit. you're making, yeah. So if you're, if you're making literal pennies, if you're making under a dollar, if it's like, you know, I had a thousand views over the course of six months on a video or something like that, you're not going to be generating value that it's worth sharing that value with sure. us. Absolutely. Um, and so in those cases, we'll usually direct them to the book, which we have on our website. Um, and you can download it for free. It's called uh, How the Music Business Works. And the third edition is going to come out in January, I believe is the release date. The second edition is up. We direct them to the book where we talk a lot about the mechanics of how to actually do some of the things that everybody else talks about in their books. There's a lot of books out there that are really great about theory, but they don't get to how do you actually do it. Yeah, they and tell you do. what to do but not how to do it mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I get and that. so in in those cases where we you, you may not be ready for us or ready for an administrator we'll direct them to the book and give them a little bit of advice um and sometimes might if it's a serious issue we we have you know we've been like okay these are attorneys that you might want to talk to okay we have had a few serious copyright issues come up in those scenarios where we're like look we can help you as an administrator, but you need to get that solved first. Hmm. And here's some names that you might want to talk to that we, here's some attorneys we trust that you might want to reach out to sure. and find out more. Um, in the case where we can help them and they are ready for some support, um, we usually will talk to them about what they need. You know, do you need, you know, what is your current situation? Do you already have an administrator and you're dissatisfied? Do you, you know, what's going on in the life of your catalog that that is that is troublesome for you or what is your situation and here are some ways we might be able to help and then they'll decide they'll sit down and they'll talk about how we fit into their world. And then we draw up a contract that fits that situation and off we go to the races. All right. So it's very yeah. straight. It's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. A couple of questions for people listening. What are the biggest mistakes artists make that prevent them from collecting all the royalties they're entitled to? Okay. You, you don't have enough metadata. The more metadata you have from your co-writers or your featured performers on your on your uh, sound recordings, um, the more metadata you have, the more likely it is you are going to get paid properly. And the easier it is for your administrator to do the work. Um, I've had writers who have turned in songs where their co-writer was DJ number 73. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> DJ, DJ name, DJ <laughs> random name. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, uh, I, I don't know who that is. And I can't <laughs> deliver that to ASCAP. Yeah. Right. 
And so when I put that in and my my co-writer is DJ Random Name and then DJ Random Name, whose name is John Smith. Yeah. Goes and he delivers the song to ASCAP. It's going to be two different songs in yes. ASCAP's database. And we got confusion now about what's going on. Okay. So not having so, accurate and thorough not having metadata. Accurate metadata. So if you're sitting with your co-writers, this is, I have a database, um, I have a database for my writers that I build out and I share the templates so they can build out themselves as well. Um, where you have all of your, like the first tab of the spreadsheet is all of your songs and what you control and, and your co-writers names and, and all of this stuff. And then the second tab of this spreadsheet is your usual suspects as co-writers and all of their information, their IPI number, their publisher, their publishing entity name, their administrator, that IPI number, their ISNI number, ISNI numbers become an important metadata point now. So um, all of those numbers for their usual suspects, so we don't have to chase it every time. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and And sitting down and discussing the splits. Sitting down and going, okay. We've been in the studio for 12 hours. We hate each other. We smell. We're starving. And everybody needs a whiskey. All right. But y'all need to take a few more minutes and talk about who contributed creatively as a songwriter and who cre contributed as a musician who's not a songwriter. you you got to fight through and have that conversation. Because if you don't, we're going to end up with somebody claiming more percentage than you think they should. Yeah. And we're going to end up in, then your publishers and your administrators need to have this conversation. Right. And that's not going to be an easy one. That's not going to be easy either. And we're going to get uncomfortable phone calls from me going, okay, okay, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. Your boyfriend was on the phone and he signed to EMI and that's why EMI is claiming 75%. Okay. How long were you on the phone with him? Yeah. <laughs> what did you talk about? Right. Again, actual scenario that's yeah. happened to me in my career. Unreal. Boyfriend was on the phone. Mentioned something random about the song. He said something and all of a sudden EMI was claiming 25% of the song. And I'm like, uh, what? Because of his phone call, what he mentioned on the phone call. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Wow. Yep. Wow. Um, that was a wake up call for my writer, for sure. T tell me she that. Married, she married him and they're happy, by the way. They're amazing. <laughs> they're an amazing couple. <laughs> what, aside from artists checking out that content page, which really is fantastic, it's exploration.io forward slash learn. Mm -hmm. Are there some other things they can do to get up to speed on this area of the business? Yes. Um, I am also the vice president of the California Copyright Conference. You, you had so many things you're doing. I'm like, I can't <laughs> read all these. This is like cutting it. It'd be like five, ten minutes. To like, I was like Just so impressed through the with organizations. That. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, the California organ networking. Very important. Building relationships in this business, not just with fellow songwriters, but with industry people. How are you going to find the best manager or the best attorney out there if you don't go out and meet a bunch of attorneys and meet a bunch of people who need attorneys and have used attorneys and get in uh, good referrals and good understandings? So uh, joining organizations like California Copyright Conference, where you can go to events and see webinars and in-person panels about these topics is really, really important. Um, you don't just build relationships, but you also learn about these things in real time. What's happening as it's happening? What's going on? Are you curious about what's going on in AI? There's going to be a panel out there on it. And there's several organizations you can look at. Um, California Copyright Conference, the CCC.org. Uh, AIMP, Association of Independent Music Publishers. 
Um, there's a new songwriters organization out there called the 100 Percenters, which I haven't had a chance to really dig into. They're new to me. I think they've been around for a little bit, but they're new to me. And I'm really interested to see what they're, where they're going and what they're doing. And then my favorite organization, which is Songwriters of North America, SONA, um, built, put together by songwriters for songwriters to really dig in and understand what's going on and, and to help fight for better rates, fight for songwriters just in general out there in the world. Um, and one of the most important things is that to help other songwriters feel like they're not alone. Yeah. yeah, that is important. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. a, a shameless plug to guys listening. We have a whole chapter in music, a module in music licensing profits. We talk a lot about how to network and because a lot of musicians feel mm -hmm. awkward about that. And they just, yeah. you know, and that's a, it's a real thing. And, mm -hmm. but networking is fun if you it approach is, it yes. like that, you know, it it's is. like, if it you don't. Be. Can't yeah, be. it can be. It's all like everything else, your mindset about it, you know. I had I had issues, so I things like this interaction would make me extremely uncomfortable and, you know, I still even had a little bit of imposter syndrome before we started this morning. God, um, I have imposter I do... syndrome just interviewing you like I I don't feel like I know oh. enough to be like, you know, asking a lot of these questions. Um but uh it can be a very real thing. Mental health is hugely important. Yeah. And so I would also say that if there are areas where you struggle with any issue, take a look at like Music Cares, the Musicians Fund through Sona. Um, mental health is, is, I'm a huge advocate for support in that regard. And so oh, God, yeah. um, definitely there are resources out there that can help. Even if it's just mentoring for a small issue, like a little bit of imposter syndrome when you first walk in the room, or even if it's bigger issues like depression or uh, addiction, um, there are a lot of organizations that offer help out there. And if that particular organization can't help you, I have not seen an organization not connect you to a sister group. Yeah, refer to yeah. Try to connect you to a mentor, try to connect you somewhere where you can get some support. Uh, yeah. I've had half a dozen artists on the show that have gotten sober through Music Airs. Mm -hmm. So that's right. everything you're and saying. And it's not just true. The thing I learned a few years ago about Music Airs is that it's also for people in the industry. Uh, a friend of mine, she was an executive and she had breast cancer. And she struggled to make ends meet and struggled with a lot about that around that time. And, um, she was able to reach out to music cares and also get support That's even awesome. through that health crisis as an executive. It's That's there for great. all of us, primarily musicians and primarily their biggest, their biggest challenge out there for them is, is the addictions. Is but, addiction. Totally. Yeah. But it is there as a resource for all of us in the music industry. When we're struggling. That's great. I didn't. I didn't know that. That's really great. So this is a bit of a controversial question for most, and we've I've kind of alluded to this, but for most artists, the business aspect of their life is just something they're not. They don't like it. They're not comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Then when things go wrong, they're upset. Mm -hmm. So for people who find themselves or who have found themselves in this situation, what kind of practical or even like tough love advice would you give them? If I find myself in a situation where I am upset at a co-publisher, a client, uh, a situation that's out of my control, uh, a publisher, an old administrator that just will not let go of a song that I now control. They, uh, the executive vice president number 83 <laughs> of giant corporation that will not answer the phone. When I find myself, the very first thing, when I find myself in that situation, I do. And this is something I learned from my business partner, Aaron. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you tired? 
Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Yeah, halt. Yeah. Yeah. Those are. Check that first. It's That's not going to change the facts about whatever's going on. All it's going to do is it's going to check your, it's going to check your inner Karen. <laughs> Is yeah. all that's going to do to check those things. Inner camera. That's funny. I think we have learned enough by watching social media over the last few years to know that Karen behavior is not going to get a solution to a problem. Correct. And that's ultimately what you want. So check those things first. Take a breath. Go get some fresh air. Put your hands in some dirt. Hug a tree for a minute. Have a coffee. Take a moment. Yeah. Your emotions are valid. Your feelings about the situation are valid. That doesn't change. But ultimately, you want to get to solution. You want a problem fixed. you got to approach it like you want to fix it, not like you just want to raise hell. Yeah. So that's the first thing. When I am in that situation, that's the first thing I have to recognize. Now, does that mean I never accidentally boil over and end up venting? <laughs> no, I end up venting. Sometimes a lot. So do I screw that up sometimes? I'm not perfect either. Yeah, I screw that first part up sometimes, sure. often. But um, But when you stop and you do that, you fix those things first. Check those things first. Then you can then drill down. I try to drill down to the facts. Is there a timeline? Um, where did the time, where did it, where is that timeline of things that happened different from what I expected? I like to clean my house before I throw stones at somebody else's dirty house. Okay. That's a good one. If. If I gave shit metadata to them, how can I expect them to have executed to the highest of their abilities? Right. So how was the, how was my expectation different? And then, so I check myself, I check what, what did I bring to the table? Did I muck this up before it even got to them? I check everything over here in my own house before I start laying out somebody else's, it's somebody else's problem sure. to fix or somebody else screwed up. That's who I am. I was raised a people pleaser. I was raised in an environment that conditioned that, but I don't know how I handled it with the great. I don't know how necessarily it came to the grace that I think I deal with it now. Um, some people call it people pleasing. Some people like think that it invalidates their emotion or invalidates their feelings or, you know, and it doesn't, none of that invalidates anything emotionally that you're feeling. It doesn't make them right and you wrong. It doesn't make you right and them wrong. You still got to go through the facts yeah. with them and figure out a lot of things to make a situation right. Sometimes a few things, but sometimes a lot of things. But that's usually where I start. That was a great answer. Thank you. I tell you what, women approach that kind of an answer so differently than guys. And it's so much better how you approach it than how I would have answered that. I got to be honest with you. I would have been like, look, boom, 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 you know, and you're like so thoughtful and sweet about everything. I, uh, I just learned a long time ago that I'm human. Yeah, you're right. But you, we all are. And sometimes I might screw up. And so if I see somebody flying off the rails and reply to an email I sent, the first thing I'm going to do is go, what, what did I say? Did I, did I typo something? Did I say massage instead of message? What did, yeah. what happened? And if that all checks out, then I know I need to go into that with some grace and give them some room because they're yeah, having something's a, going on there. They're having a big feeling. They're having an emotional moment and it might have nothing to do with anything to do with me or my company or the business that we're doing. Oh, most of the time they're, it doesn't. You know, their dog might have gotten hit by a car yeah. Yeah. and they can't do anything. It's at the vet and they're just freaked out. Yeah. So just go into it with just go into it with a little empathy. 
and and a little grace and a little humility. None of those things will change the facts. The facts will so have true. remained the same. Yeah. But you'll be able to get to the facts and understand the facts and find a solution a lot quicker if one of you is not coming in hot and can help the other person to cool to get to the facts. Yeah, de-escalating is always smart. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a great answer. Thank you. Renee, you've done a lot of work for well-known artists, people like Alison Krauss, Vince Gill, Kings of Leon, Kiss, Bruno Mars, Beyonce, Eminem, Pink, Pete Townsend, and I think Joe Perry, right? Yeah, Joe Perry's my favorite client. It's always going to be. How did I, had, I know I didn't that? have... <laughs> I didn't have a favorite client until Joe Perry was my client. <laughs> <laughs> Are you usually interfacing with the artists themselves or, or with their management or both? Depends on the client. Right. Some are, um, you know, when uh, Peter Hernandez, who became Bruno Mars, was signed to Windswept back in the day. Uh, we worked. Oh, wow. So worked, he's a holdover yeah. from. Oh, that's mm -hmm. so cool. Yeah. Uh, we, I ended up working. You know, talking to him, um, talking to people close to him. Um, on the other hand, when working with Allison Krauss, I talked 99% of the time to her manager. Okay. So, um, so you just develop, it's how the relationship develops. And I would encourage everybody to be open, especially in the industry side, the business person side. Don't get hamstrung over how the relationship with the client develops. You know, if you don't talk to the artist every day, like you wanted to, are you still getting the work done? Yeah. Is everything that's supposed to happen still happening? That's the important part. Sure. That's, that's if, you're, right. if you're blocked by a manager every five minutes and you can't discuss, get discussed what needs to be discussed, yeah, what did you do then? Well, I I just you fire the client. No, I didn't fire the client. It wasn't the client's fault that the manager. It was sort of like we just had a little come to Jesus powwow. The client had emailed me and was like, "Hey, I don't understand why this thing's not done," and I'm going, "Okay, do I throw this manager under the bus by your saying, manager's you know, an asshole?" I have, I'm sitting Send. here, right? <laughs> I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here with my email upon email of follow up to the manager and not hearing anything mm. back. And I was like, well, I could send all of this to the artist and go, I have 27 follow ups over the course of two months where I didn't hear anything back trying to get this job done. Or what I did in that situation was I went back to the manager and I was like, look, uh, let's go have a drink. Let's go have a chat. Let's go have dinner. Oh, you did? Wow. Yeah. And I was and like, even though you had some you had some friction with this person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow, there, that's this pretty was, this my our relationship, Exploration's relationship with the manager was causing friction with the songwriter. Yeah. Because the songwriter was very, very high level and did not have bandwidth. They have they have shit to do in the world. And the right. manager, they trusted to handle everything. So the re the key to the relationship was the manager. The key to getting things done with the artist was the manager. It wasn't going to happen without the manager. So the relationship with the artist didn't need fixing. The right. relationship with the manager needed fixing. And it turns out the relationship between the manager and the artist needed a little nudging, needed a little help. Right. And so I was just like, let's go have a drink. Let's go have a steak and some whiskey. Oh, that sounds really good. Um, it does. <laughs> but uh, let's, yeah, let's just go have a steak and a whiskey and let's, let's talk. So here's, here's what I'm seeing. Here's, well, here's what needs to happen. And here's why it needs to happen. Now, when these things happen, when, when this gets done and fixed, then this can happen. Well, that's the thing we really want to get to. That's where we're, I'm like, yeah. So how can we get the artist to move to step two so you and I can move to step three? I don't know. 
man, you know, taught, you know, trying to get them on the phone and trying to do this. It's like so crazy. And I'm like, okay, okay. Let's try, let's try. What about this tactic? And then just start mm. to make a plan. And now all of a sudden his manager really likes me and won't leave me alone. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But at least the headaches realize, dissolved. Yeah. They realize we're on the same team. And sometimes you yeah. forget, sometimes you forget that you're on the same team. Sometimes yeah. it looks like people are in, you know, working against each other and you're not ultimately the goal is the songwriters hopes and dreams and what they want to have done and what they want. And as long as you're all working towards that goal, you're on the same team. You're just seeing it from different perspectives. And all it really took was to just nail down for the manager that like, look, you got to have an uncomfortable conversation with your friend who has hired you as their manager. Right. You're going to have awesome. to do it or where none of us is going to make any money for them. And they're going to fire us all. That's great. Like, all you need to do is go have an uncomfortable conversation. And he was and, like, and I I'm think I'm going to try do. this. Yeah, he did. He was like, I think I'm going to try this steak and whiskey thing. I was like, please steal the idea. <laughs> Spread the joy of steak and whiskey. <laughs> Spread the joy the of steak and whiskey. Yeah, right. <laughs> right on. And they had an uncomfortable conversation as friends that made their manager, manager artist relationship stronger. Is that going to work every time? Probably not. <laughs> no, but that's a pretty good, a that's a pretty good, you know, I mean, like, a, what else can you do? Yeah. What else can you do? Mm -hmm. I find Renee. that having a steak and whiskey with people is just the perfect way to like. Yeah. What the all. hell's the downside of that? My God. Is there any funny or interesting stories about how you wound up connecting with any of the more well-known artists that you've worked for or worked with, <laughs> I should say? I started down the road of the Carol King story. <laughs> yeah, you did. Her daughter. The end of it. Her, her daughter, her... who is amazing and wonderful and is so talented, and I was denying her request for a reduced rate on the mechanicals because, you know, my writers were not subject to the same agreement with her label that she was. And Right. Okay. So now I should preface this by saying there, is a, there was a lady at the time that was the mentor to Leticia whose name was Carol King as well. Oh, that's wild. So there's two Carol Kings. So I get a phone call and she says, this was my naivete at play. This here. is, this is the Carol King in the biz inside mm -hmm. the business, not the inside artist. the okay. business, inside the industry who worked for another publisher outside of windswept. And so I get a call and she says, hi, this is Carol King. And I was like, oh, hey, how's it going? Thinking. I love your music. <laughs> it was the publisher. I thought it was the publisher, Carol King. Oh, And so okay. I'm like, hey, how's it going? And she was like, great, great. She's like, for this song on this album, we need a reduced rate. And she proceeds to try to negotiate this reduced rate with me. And I tell her no, 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 no. And then she proceeds to say, well, that's my daughter. You know, that's my daughter, right? And I was like, well, I'm sorry, but that still doesn't warrant me giving a, you know, discounting how much money my writers are supposed to make this, sure. you know, thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs> and I hung up. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs> and I hung up on her. I hung up on Carol King. And, and, and I'm sitting there for a moment and I'm like, wait, wait, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, that was Carol King, Carol King. Not that was, the... you make me feel like a natural woman, Carol King. That was, oh my God. And I just, the mortification overtook me in a solid wave all the way down to my toes. So how did you... uh Handle that. And I just, I, I slowly got out of my chair and walked to Leticia's office and I, I sat down and, and the look on my face had to be something like, 
<laughs> and I was like, I, I think you, I think I, I think I fucked up. I think I fucked up, Leticia. <laughs> oh my God, Leticia, you're going to have to fire me. I was so freaked out and scared. And she goes, what happened? And I was like, I told Carol King, no, she couldn't have a reduced rate for her daughter. And I hung up on her. And Leticia washing over her face the same sort of realization <laughs> of what's happened. And, 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 and she took a deep breath and she was like, okay, break it down for me. What exactly happened? Again, getting to that core of the facts. Yeah. Even though both of us were like waiting for Evan Meadow or Jonathan Stone, the big bosses at Windswept to like run screaming over any moment <laughs> where she has probably called them like and um and i tell her you know this this artist has been trying to get a reduced rate for this song um that is a cover of a song by our writers i have been denying it because i don't see the reason why we sh our writers should get paid less and that is apparently Carol King's daughter, and she called to throw some of her weight behind that request. Fair enough that she did. I'm hmm. not knocking that tactic. I think that's perfectly fair. She wants to fight for her daughter. Um, and and I said, and am I fired now, Leticia? And she goes, she thinks about it for a moment. And she goes, no, no, you're not fired. No, you were right. Our writers have a right to collect their full rate for that song. You did not have to grant it. And Good. thank you for standing your ground for our writers. Yeah. And I was like, is Carol King going to be mad at me for the rest of my life? Am I never going to be able to meet Carol King or talk to her? And she was like, no, <laughs> she'll eventually forget in like 20 years or so. So maybe someday <laughs> in 20 years. <laughs> we can go and talk to her. Um, and uh, and something else Leticia said later, um, a few years later when we were talking about it, she was like, I will bet money that if Carol King remembers the incident at all, which I don't know if she does or not, but if she remembers it at all, she probably respects the hell out of you now yeah. for standing up for your writers. A absolutely. Because in the she's moment, a songwriter. she was probably pretty mad at you. Know, yeah. In the moment, she's she was a, probably pretty she, mad at me. But yeah. At the end of the day, if she even remembers it ever happening, right? she probably has a lot of respect for you for standing up for your writers. So. She should as a songwriter herself, mm -hmm. as a prolific yeah. songwriter. Yeah. But either That's way, awesome. even if she was still mad at me, I would still respect her because she was a mom fighting for her baby in that moment. So I still respect that from her. Hey, what are some... Act, you, uh, let's talk. Let's go this one. In your bio, you mentioned you're in an industry that's very male dominated, which obviously it is. Yes. To whatever extent you're comfortable, any kind or what kinds of bullshit have you had to put up with as a result of this? And what have you found to be the best way to set boundaries in those situations? Ooh. Um, hmm. I think most of my bullshit came early on. I was I was protected, of course, because my grandfather protected me from a lot of stuff um, from seeing or from understanding in the moment what things were. Uh, anything that was n nasty that I was exposed to was not music industry related, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I got bullshit for being a fan. I think that was one thing. I think that's, I think that's something that women get, get some shit like about. Like a fan of one of your artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of being Why a fan. Get... I came into this industry because I was a fan. We're all in this industry because we're a fan of somebody. Yeah. yeah. And and I, you know, I got, I would be excited, and I like, I like to go to shows, and I like to dance in the aisle, and I like to shout and sing along, and I'm gonna keep doing it. I'm not going to go to a concert and be the guy in the back of the room that looks like he wants to work for security and just stare at my <laughs> artist for two hours and show no emotion. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, 
but I've, I've gotten shit for being a fan of my clients. I've gotten shit for, um, I've gotten shit for dyeing my hair before. I've gotten shit for getting gray hair before. Wow. Uh, that, I've gotten, um, that blows my and, mind actually. Yeah. And, and like for dyeing your hair, I got, yeah. And you'd be surprised at where some of the shit comes from. Wow. Like what, like, what was the complaint there? <laughs> like, isn't that like a, that's like wearing was a, from a colored shirt that you want to wear. I it mean, was from isn't... a woman. Wow. It was from a powerful woman in the industry who said, I'm not going to take lessons in how to do my job from some chick who dyes her hair. Oh my God. And I was like, okay, cool. Wow. Peace out. Yeah. Bye. Right. Like, what are you going <laughs> to do with that? Like, yeah. Like, what, what do you do, you do with that? that? And what do yeah. you do with it when it, what do you do when that kind of thing comes from other women? Um, that's bizarre as hell. I got to tell you. Yeah. And even to this day, I firmly believe that she was venting about something that had nothing to do with me. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm and sure. so I don't hate her for it. Um, I, I took it for what it was. It was an, uh, an unfortunate interaction um, that did not break my stride. Yeah, good for you. Um, there's also a place that I know that I come from a lot of privilege. Um, I'm white and blonde with blue eyes. I, I try to check myself. I try to look around the room and evaluate the situation and go, okay, what are the words coming out of my mouth here? You know, what am I saying? Um, but bullshit in general from men, it comes at you. Sometimes you can handle it with grace. Sometimes you can handle it with a laugh and, and, and take it as a joke and pawn it off and break the tension. Sometimes you've got to confront it head on. Sometimes you've got to say, okay, we're not going to gaslight in this conversation and call it out for what it is. And that can be hard. Um, but I got, I got a lot of shit for being a fan in college from professors. I don't even get um, that. And, and, and that, that struggle is really well. That's something that actually haunts me sometimes. That's something I struggle with that like, Oh my God, I really respect this artist. And, and I, I'm not just, I'm not just a fan. And the little girl in me hurts again. Yeah. That's terrible and, because um, that's the whole reason like people, like you said, get into this business. Yeah. We're all here because we were a fan of somebody, somebody, somebody did a concert somewhere and we were there and we saw that music and we heard that music and we fell in love with the, with the music so much that we put up with the industry. Yeah. Yeah. I've had, I've and, had musicians tell me, Craig, I would play for free. It's all the bullshit and the travel and the rest of the industry that I have to get paid for. I love mm -hmm. the music so much. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, so that, that really, that's the one that affects me, um, the most, um, I was, I don't know why, but I was in enough situations where I didn't, I don't recognize in my history where I got excessively sexually harassed. I'm sure there were moments when I just was clueless. It was happening. Either I was too young or too innocent or too jaded <laughs> to pay attention <laughs> at some point. Yeah. Um, but, um, but most of anything that happened in my life where I felt sexually harassed was outside of the industry. Yeah. That's, I, I know that I am lucky in that regard. That is not the truth for most people. Most women for a lot of women. In the yeah. Industry. yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what I try to do, I think, you know, 
is to provide a safe space for friends or for any woman in the industry. Even, even if it's a woman who hates me, but she needs to vent or she needs to just have a moment or she needs to just commiserate or whatever to create a safe space in my world where people can just breathe and be and vent or talk or relate or anything like that. And here's the thing I think we really, really, really forget. It is not just women who experience the sexual harassment or the sexualization or the abuse in our industry. There are plenty of men who experience it. Really? And go through it from wow. women and from men. There are plenty of it. How many, the number of times I have watched my artists get groped on stage by female fans. And I'm not just talking about like touching their leg. I'm talking about like, you know, groping. Full on crotch grab. <laughs> Full on crotch grabbing and things. Wow. And people are like, oh, he's a dude. He must love it. I'm sorry. It's assault. It's sexual assault. Yeah. If you do it to a female artist, you get arrested, you get thrown out. Yeah. Right. You get your ass kicked by her fans. Yeah. You do it to a guy. Oh, the guy must love that. He's a guy. No, I'm yeah, sorry. Not if he's in it's a good still, marriage with three kids at home waiting for him. Yeah. Or just not if he's in general a human yeah. being who yeah. has, you know, doesn't want to be groped. Yeah. He doesn't want to be groped. Yeah. Yeah. We're all people that don't want to be groped. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so it's still sexual assault when that happens. And yet it's looked at very differently and treated very differently. Yeah. I don't see security running down and putting a lot of those women out. Yeah. Yeah. It happens in the industry side as well. I mean, I am absolutely certain that there are male interns that have been, you know, ogled. Things like that. It happens. It happens. And mm -hmm. it happens to men and it happens to women. I am not going to sit here and claim to be an expert to be able to give you percentages. But what I can tell you as a survivor of abuse and everything else that can happen to a young woman in this world, nobody's, there, there is no winner. Your struggle is not better or greater or more tragic than my struggle. Nobody's horror story, horror story is more or less horrific than anybody else's. It's not, uh, we're not trying to win any scale here. There's no scale. There's no billboard top 10 of horrific abuse stories. And that's the thing that I see happen. I see that happen on social media quite a bit. Well, yeah, that happened to you, but wait till you hear about what happened to me. Yeah, I, and, I don't. I, to social media yeah. is just not it's very social, it's not great is it? For that, everybody you know, struggles. Everybody has something that they struggle with. And for abuse survivors, we have to get, we have to support each other and just go. You know what? That happened to you, and that's horrific. What? What do you? Are you in the early stages of surviving it? How can I help you? What do you need? Focus on them. And then as they start to heal and everything, okay, you know what? That happened to you and that is horrific. Can I share my story with you to maybe help you see a different perspective or get an idea of how you can lift up from this? That's a helpful way to share that you went through it too, but without degrading what that person's going through. Yeah, it really is, actually. You know, and by sharing these things, we shine a light on them. We learn that we're not alone. We help each other. It's when it becomes a game of one-upsmanship that I tend to, like, check out of those conversations. And I see it happen. I see it happen in the industry, too. So, yeah. 
All right, let's. I want to talk about those sixteen guitars behind you. Ah, <laughs> my babies. Are, are you still babies. playing guitar nowadays? Um, I play well enough to know I should not get paid to play guitar. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> No, that's the you truth. Know, that's but the you know absolute what? Do, truth. Do you know how many artists I've had on my show that have said the same thing? They're like, I can't. I, I'm serious. They're like, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. I mean, it's like a kind of a, a, a running joke almost. What What is your go to guitar right now? And what others? What other two would round out your top three? I pulled down a few of them to show Good. you. To just show you, my number one go to is always this guitar that I named Grandpa. This oh, was my that's grandpa's. so cute. That was your grandfather's this my, guitar. This was my grandpa, my grandfather's guitar. Guitar. It's from the fifties. It's an Epiphone, wow. um, and it is beautiful and wonderful. And um, that must sound this amazing. This guitar has been this guitar has been in my care since I was six years old. That's amazing. Yeah, and that so, guitar is seventy years old at this point, or close to that. Yeah, she's a good girl. Wow, she's been through a lot. She and I've been beautiful. through a lot together. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So that's that's my. This is my, always my go-to. Always, and it's named Grandpa. My top three right now. My top three changes every day. Now that the first guitar I ever bought with my own money was this uh, Joe Perry Gibson oh, from yeah. 1997. First one I ever bought with my own money. She and I have been through a hell of a lot together. Um, and she's my ride or die. But uh, that's the one you grab because, if the huh? if there's that's the electric you grab if, if there's, there's a fire. A fire yeah. That's the one I grab. Grandpa and I grab and her. Joe Perry. Uh, and uh, her name is Roxy. <laughs> that must weigh a ton if it's a '97 Les Paul. She does way a ton. She she's yeah. If I never need to carry weights on the treadmill or whatever, I'll just like grab Roxy, yeah. carry those weights. Yeah. Um but to round out my top three right now, I have a newer a newer one to me. It's a used one. It is an Eddie Ball um Axis Sport. And I call her Natasha. Oh, that's a that's a music man, yeah. It's amazing, man. Yeah. She's brilliant. She's great. And then um, currently right now, that is uh, my little feisty child that uh, I can't seem to get uh, an understanding with is the the new Joe Perry from Les Paul, the Gold Rush. Oh, that's, you know what? That looks like a, um, that's very similar to Dave Amato's guitar with a, except Dave has a, yeah. Like a, yeah. I don't know if you know Dave, yeah. but that's wild. That's a single, uh, it's a single humbucker, um, mm -hmm. gold, less Paul, gold top. Yeah. Gold top. Yeah. So why are you uh, not having, why are you not getting along with that guitar? It's just hard to play. Geez, it's resisting. It's, um, I, you know, I think that they all have some personalities and I think my personality kind of goes with them, but she, uh, I don't know. She just is, is, is temperamental to me. I make adjustments, you know, to the strings. She doesn't want to stay in tune. Um, it's nothing wrong with the guitar itself. I think, have you ever, you know, have you ever, you, well, you're a dad. So have you ever had like a a period of time where one of your kids was just like fussy when they were a baby. Oh God. For a little while. <laughs> yeah. They were just, they were just, they were just fussy. You could do everything that you knew to do as a parent and do it every, and do it perfectly. But just for some reason, the baby was just fussy and needed to work through it. And I think she and I are just having one of those phases You're where we're just stage. learning who each other is. And it takes time to do that. I got this one used um, maybe about a year and a half ago or so. And so it takes time. And, you know, I've got 16 of them. What do you play mostly? What kind of music do you mostly play? You like to. Um, do you still play I country? Just, I do still, I do still play some country. Um, mostly I just kind of pick around um, and, and just try some things out and just try to, you know, here's the thing. Uh, I really love the hum of the amp 
in the headphones, uh -huh. even when I'm not playing. I have been known to just take a nap, just turn the amp just on. Leave the, the amp on? And just take a wow. nap. What amp do you and have? So, what kind of amp are you playing out of? Uh, right now I'm playing a, a Line 6 Spider. Okay. Over here in the corner. Um, and I use headphones because I respect my downstairs neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> I don't always, if I know that they're not home, I will, you know, unplug the headphones and crank it up a little bit. But, um, but mostly I use the headphones with it just because it's like, okay, let's, we all got to live together. Well, that's thoughtful and, of you. You know, so, um, but I, I really like that sound. And so even just sometimes I'll try to pick out something I love. I can play the slowest version of Walk This Way you've ever heard in your entire life. What a, see, that's another, just like that song, Every, everything that he's come up with has been pretty innovative. I can't play it faster. I can't play it at any speed with which anyone could sing it properly. But I can recognize who it's like, you know. Give me your, uh, Renee, give me your top three Desert Island discs. Just no particular order and just for right now, because obviously that changes all the time. All right, once again, Joe Perry's solo album, Let the Music Do the Talking, the first mm -hmm. one. Um, I'm going to say... Um, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um, the soundtrack to uh, Wonder Woman, the Wonder Woman movie. I Some haven't seen that movie. Great music in there great music you gotta have you gotta have some if you're on a desert island you gotta have some music that's gonna fire you up to fight <laughs> to survive so you some really good through. score will do that to you um and then uh a friend of mine named stephen gooding any cd from stephen gooding uh his collection is any cd by gooding any of those i'll grab any any of them and take it with me um just because his perspective on the world and his perspective on humanity in his songwriting is so beautiful and and it's just a reflection of of all the good human that we can be. I really like his writing. What kind of music does he play? Uh it's kind of a country rock thing. I mean, it's rock music, but it's there's so many different places that he goes on his journey as an artist that it just kind of like it's in, you know, the, the best way to describe it is indie rock, but that sells it so short. If that gotcha. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Tell me, let's see here. Most important lessons you've learned from getting older. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm getting older. Okay. Um TMI for all the men, but ladies <laughs> ladies perimenopause is a perilous journey wrought with with twists and turns and underwater currents which will grab your leg and throw you against the rocks. And I feel for women having to go through that, let me tell you. And you're not alone in it and you'll never be alone in it. The struggle is real for all of us. <laughs> Hang in there. <laughs> that's, it, it, that's number it, one. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, I feel yeah. I feel for women. That is not and an easy men thing to go just just men just have just have more patience with us at that phase. Yeah, it's a tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a tough question. We like most about yourself. I like that even after 40, you know, after 40 years in the industry, a lot of people are just like, okay, I'm done. Peace out. I still want to fight. I hear about a songwriter who is like, they won't let me out of my deal. Oh my God. Their commission is 40% or, um, I don't understand the MLC. There's a band right now. Oh, I wanted to mention this because maybe they'll watch your show, but there's a band called Downstate and they have 
they write amazing, beautiful works, amazing songs out there. And I love this band. And their song Kingdom is one of the greatest songs in the world. One of the best rock songs ever done. It's beautiful. And I went and I was like, I want to see who their publisher is. I want to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I go and they, they don't have an MLC account. And nobody's so they, collecting their YouTube royalties. And so um, oh my God. I, I reached out to them and I was like, hey, guys, um, I'm a fan. Your music's great. I just want to say, like, um, this is not a sales pitch, but there's money on the table that's out there. Here's, like, the gist of it. And and if you want some help, please let me know, because I would love to even just consult for you and give you some advice and set you on the right path. I would love to even just do that for free for you. Never heard anything back from them. I don't know what's going on. I and and so I would like. I love that I want to wow. fight for this band that I have no connection to whatsoever. They're just out there in the wild, making great music, wow. and I just want to fight for them. And that's the thing I love about myself is I want to fight for writers. I want to fight for artists, and and I still want to do that. And downstate, if you're watching, please, please. Please. Well, if I get one of those get guys, get your on MLC my... account set up. Get your MLC account. If I account get them on my show, I'll make sure they hook up with you. Please. If some, Please. At just some make point sure they get yeah. their MLC account. I don't even have to be hooked up with them. No, I'm just going to tell them to call you. I'm not going to yeah. do that because you could serve them much better than I can <laughs> by telling them that. They're amazing. They're making great music. Where are they out? Full of? of passion and life. Uh, I think they're out of Indiana. Okay. Yeah. Their PRO stitch they have under control. It's everything else they need. They need to get moving there we go renee tell me the happiest time in your life or the happiest moment in your life the happiest moment in my life um was this weekend um on the couch over there in this room um showing my beautiful chosen family niece who's two years old um letting her pick out any guitar she wanted on the wall and letting her just sit and play with it really that was the happiest time that was, so the it was happiest just a special moment was it like a special connection or a special and moment just i have a like... violin i have a violin that was signed by les paul that's that's a that's How a first obtuse is yeah it? yeah um and uh, I got it out. She wanted to see it. It's it's in a case like guitars, and so she thought it was a little guitar. And I was like, no, sure. no, 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 very expensive, very special. But I sat her on my lap and I played it with her. And I'm actually going to get choked up about this. That's all right. To um, I wish, I wish, I wish, with all of my heart, that my grandfather could have. Um, been in a position to do more with me. And um, being able to do that for her, for, for this beautiful, beautiful little girl who um, is chosen family. It's not like she was routed to me by blood, <laughs> you know. Um, to give her this opportunity to be exposed to this music at two years old to be able to play guitar, to be able to do those things. It reminded me of being two or three years old, sitting with my grandpa and him doing the same thing for me. That's so nice. And I have that picture um, of that happening uh, somewhere in my social media. I posted it, but um, the realization that I was passing that on to someone was extraordinary yeah sorry no thank you for sharing that That was really sweet are you kidding me that That, was really nice i'm glad you got i'm really glad you got to yeah got to experience that otherwise it was going to be some another joe perry story dude (laughs) (laughs) uh two more questions most important lesson life has taught you um always bet on yourself you know what you're the third person who always gave bet me on that yourself. answer. 
And you know how who I learned that from? I learned that from the Undertaker. <laughs> oh, from the Undertaker. Yeah, <laughs> he said that to that's, me. He was like, "Always bet on yourself." That's great. Oh my god, mm -hmm. I, I can't believe it. You're literally the third person that said that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's really. Yeah. And the first two guys have said it. The first guy that said it was Keith Nelson, the founder of Buck Cherry, and a great songwriter and pr producer. He <laughs> referred me to Oliver Lieber, who was, you know, Lieber in installed, Jerry Lieber's son. Yeah. And Oliver said the same answer. How odd is it that those two guys were connected? <laughs> and I was like, holy that's shit, amazing. that's weird. Yeah, that was really, really random. Yeah. And last question, and I just want to tell you, I can't thank you enough for your time. I, I literally, just so people know, I had to cut back like half. I mean, you have such good information. And, you know, we didn't even, I didn't, listen, I want to just say something too. I want to just acknowledge you to put a company together with 50 people and to do that is so, you know, so freaking awesome. And I have so much respect for you because I know how hard Thank that you. is. And I, and that just doesn't happen overnight. And I, and for you to be kind enough and, and share this much of your time, and I know how freaking busy you are. I, I really appreciate it. So thank you very much. It's, it's really been, you know, it's worth, it's been worth you. every minute of it. And I do want to take just a moment before you ask your last question to yeah. give a shout out to my business partner, Aaron Davis, who, uh, we put up with each other. He's like a baby brother to me. Um, and, and none of it would have been possible without him, uh, awesome. at my side. We couldn't have done it individually. We did it together. That's so, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years. And has this change been intent? Was this intentional change or a natural part of aging? Ooh, biggest change in my personality. Uh, I think the biggest change in my personality is that I consider myself to be in my uh, in my my no fucks era, my zero right fucks on. love era. <laughs> I don't give a fuck. That's um, awesome. I I find that there isn't any topic I won't talk about. There isn't any truth I won't say. I may say that truth with a lot of grace and respect to people who've come before me or people who, who are powerful in this industry, but I will speak truth to power and it doesn't matter who that power is. And, Good. um, we have to be able to do that. And yeah. And so I'm in my, I'm in my zero fucks era. I, I, I don't care. Um, Good. You're not going to knock me down. My reputation stands on its own. And if I speak truth from my experience and my observations and my learning, um, it's good enough for anyone. So, Thanks. Yeah. That was a great mm -hmm. answer. Let me tell people where to find you. And then I want you to talk about Janie's phone because I know you're okay. in involved in that. Cool. All right, so Renee Meredith, and I'm realizing here I spelled your last name wrong. It's M E R I. Um, it's okay. Sorry about that. I let uh, it slide. All right, you did. I was very impressed. And once I realized, <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. Uh, okay, third edition of How the Music Business Works is now out when this comes out. Download mm -hmm. it at exploration.io forward slash learn. And I would honestly, if this is something you want to learn more about, and if you want to eventually get involved with exploration as a company to work for you and represent you. I, I would go through all of the learning aids on that page because you'll be serving yourself and, mm -hmm. and anybody that you meet with at exploration, because you'll have a lot more knowledge and familiarity with what you're looking to get done. I mean, there's tons of great stuff on that. Page. I even told John about that yesterday. Um, <laughs> And you can get that book, How the, Music Biz How the Music Business Works, the third edition. It's a free download. If you want to have the physical copy, you just got to pay mm -hmm. shipping and handling, and they'll mail you the physical copy. And Fair warning on that shipping and handling. It is a 700-page book. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's no, like, I'm just saying to be, be, you know, be fair warning on, you know, <laughs> opening the book and starting and to handling, read it. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. shipping and handling. Uh, wow. I, you know, it's funny when you said to me, the book is called How the Music Business Works. I said to myself, God, do you have enough time to write that? And apparently you did. <laughs> it's like, a team effort. It yeah. was a team effort. 
my name is on it as part of a team uh, at Exploration that wrote it. So, yeah. Tell me about Janie's Fund and your involvement in it and why you like it. Speaking of getting emotional, I promise you I'm going to get emotional again here. That's great. Um, so Janie's Fund is an organization that helps abuse and neglected girls. Um, I myself went through um, a lot of abuse and, and neglect as a child. Um, and uh, it, it changed my course. Um, but I never felt safe. I never felt safe. Um, and I had to learn how to feel safe. I had to teach myself how to fill out job applications. I had to teach myself how to fill out college applications. I had to, as I might put it, escape to Nashville to go to school. Um, I had to figure out what therapy was. I had to do all of those things, all the things that you do as a young adult with the support of parents and things I had to do on my own. I had to do it. Um, Janie's Fund's big program for helping abused and neglected girls is called Life Set. And for foster kids who age out of the foster system at the age of 18, in most of the United States, they age out and they're like, okay, here's your bag of stuff. Bye. See you later. They, um, they don't have, they have to, you know, find a place to live. They have to find jobs. They have to figure out how to apply to college. What do they need to do? And there, that shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't, we shouldn't have these kids who we have put into foster care for decades sometimes suddenly be out and out thrown to the wolves in the wild. And so Life Set provides counseling. It provides mentoring. Um, it provides just some one-on-one -on -one instruction sometimes to help these young women age out of foster care uh, with some knowledge and some skills of how to navigate this world and and help them fill out job applications, help them uh, help them to figure out how to rent an apartment, help them how to continue their therapy, all of those things that uh, that these young women need. And um, I have been in their shoes, and I will forever fight for them because they they need our continued support. And you can find them at janiesfund.org. Uh, that's where they are. Renee, thank you for everything. You're a doll, and I really appreciate you sharing this, what you just thank said. You. And um, I know you've done a lot of work, and you couldn't get where you are today by not doing any work. So kudos to you for all that. All thank right? you. Thank you. Um, hang on one second. And, and again, for everybody, check out Exploration. I'm sorry, exploration.io forward slash learn to download all those resources. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very, very much to Renee Meredith. Honestly, I'd like to bring you back maybe on a part two sometime in the future sure. because you have like so much in your head that we could shake out. I mean, probably be hours <laughs> and hours. Uh, but thank you very much for spending time with us and being so kind with it. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Until next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Renee, thank you for everything. Bye, everybody.